Happy Monday, everybody. It's February 22nd, 2021. We're back at it again for weird things. Uh, and, and we are uh, semi-assembled, right? The, the gang's almost all here. Uh, uh, Bryce is live in studio. Hello. Which uh, is exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a nice... Uh, it's a it's a brisk 66 degrees. No, 69 degrees here in Austin. I mean, y'all, uh, 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 Austin sure went from 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 Minneapolis to Miami quick, huh? Well, and and it was Miami two weeks before too, right? Yeah. Like, uh, uh, just uh, if Ted Cruz had known, all he had to do is just stay still, <laughs> and he'd get exactly. Um, hello. So yeah, Brian is working on. Uh, some things around the property, seeing if we can't get some water back here because we don't have water here still. Um, yeah, that is that is the big uh, the big the big evolving thing as I am slowly weaning all of my social media uh, from Oakland accounts to I'm now dual wielding Oakland <laughs> accounts and and Austin Reddits uh -huh. right. Uh, but but the big thing that uh, I'm I'm tracking, and I'm sure everybody in Austin is tracking, is the the water pressure map. Mm -hmm. And it is it was very bleak two days ago. It is now slowly becoming something that is happening. But along with it are a lot of burst pipes, which uh, I think that's that's what Brian's trying to figure out now is as this thing turns on, making sure that it's not, you know leaking in and damaging stuff because you guys got a lot of stuff that cannot be damaged, including an entire studio <laughs> right? and editing equipment and everything else. And that's, that's even before you just get into what you also want to protect, which is like drywall and, and, and all that. Right. And so, um, uh, so he's not, he is likely not going to join us for the, uh, for the rest of weird things or after things today. I think he will be back for cord killers this evening. Um, but we'll see about that. Uh, hello, everybody. How's how are things going in uh, the world where there's only one disaster going on? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I I, I kind of feel like um, this is a, a a shockingly kind of if not normal then boring mm. uh, stretch for every place that's not texas <laughs> texas had an extraordinarily interesting in air quotes uh you know a week and a half but uh we are uh you know i think things are just kind of puttering along good you know people are arguing about uh you know on, on the for for my my other focus <laughs> like people are arguing about uh, uh, uh kind of confirmations you know, cabinet right? cabinet confirmations which yeah. is like you know, this is the kind of stuff that bored everybody out of politics when when only nerds like me cared about it. So, <laughs> gosh, do you have a good weekend, Andrew? And oh, he's oh, and he just walked away. I, was, <laughs> I didn't gone. even. Sorry about that. That was on me. Um, yeah, Spider West says, "Could you imagine if Dory didn't make the flight out when he did?" Yeah, you and uh, 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 and uh, some of our other guests who were here at the time managed to whoops, skip town just at the right time. Well, yeah, I mean. It would have been a real interesting situation if uh, uh, we hadn't locked down the house when we did, because I would still be down there looking to house hunt, which uh, right. I don't know if exactly that was happening uh, uh, throughout the frigid. I don't, I don't I don't think that there were a lot of showings happening uh, as, <laughs> as people had no power. But uh, yeah, uh, uh, Darren got the hell out of there, but he, he got the hell out of there as soon as he found out that it was going to be cold. Like oh, yeah. he was like, I'm going to go to Arizona. I'll, and I'll he, see you later. He was. He had plenty of provisions. He he was his own man. Oh, I mean, he uh, for those of you who don't know, Darren is living out of his like fully kitted out like life fan. Like mm -hmm. so, like he can be on the road for as long as he wants. Um, you know that that is that is its own uh, its own its own thing. But um, yeah, no, it was it was uh, certainly harrowing. To watch you know considering it's literally like just there and it was gorgeous and then next thing you know it is <laughs> the opposite <laughs> oh my gosh uh yeah you know the one thing i'll say my, bryce's survival tip um uh gas stations uh i went i went to go 
get some groceries uh, once the roads started to clear. All the grocery stores were were pretty had, had long lines and stuff, but gas station attached to a grocery store had a convenience store in it, and they had a had a bunch of stuff. Uh, the other thing is stock up on instant hand sanitizer. Um, you know, even if you have water, you know what what's really tough to do is to wash your hands. Uh, mm. It's it's kind of tough, and it's a it's a it's a heavy use of water to you know. Uh, uh, you know, wet your hands, get soapy. Yeah, nobody, nobody's, and- nobody's doing the full sing happy birthday twice, <laughs> right. uh, wash your hands stuff. Uh, you know, after all that happened. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I went to this gas station. There was like, uh, it was it was untouched, and the, the grocery store. I mean, it's the same. It's branded by the grocery store. It was like you know on the other side of the parking lot. No one, no one had gotten the tip that they needed to go get. Uh, you know. Go get oh, their God, Doritos yeah. and stuff from there. From Especially there. since, yeah. Oh, uh, is Andrew muted? Two other survival tips are uh, mm. always look on the very top shelf because, like, most people can't see on what's in the back of the top shelf in, like, a grocery store, and often it's you find other stuff there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the other thing is, like, restaurant supply stores. Because oh. restaurants are often, they're not stocking up. They're like, oh, we're going to be shut down for the next week, so... They're not as sometimes not as more people know about that now, but that's early on was one of the ways you could just get more stuff was go to a restaurant supply. Mm-hmm. Just a gallon of soy sauce. Just like, <laughs> yeah. set yourself up for the for, for, for the duration. The, the one thing I, I wish I had thought ahead of because I managed to go to the grocery store yesterday and stock up on on most everything that I would need to last kind of a while and just get some groceries was um, disposable utensils and plates. Um, yeah. You know, I I I got some paper plates at home, but I'm running low on forks, y'all. <laughs> running running low on forks. We're gonna be having Everybody a lot of sandwiches. Everybody send your forks to Bryce <laughs> at Forks for Bryce. <laughs> I my girlfriend laughs at me, but every time we get takeout and we don't use those forks, I just grab the extra forks and stuff and I throw them in the cupboard. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just like I'm like I'm like you just don't know like because you know we might be we might go shoot one of our movies and maybe we need extra forks and stuff for crew or whatever, but or just in general. Mm-hmm. They have all that stuff. And Kinlan's got got another one. Baby wipes. Baby wipes mm-hmm. are are very good for making sure your parts stay clean when it's hard to make sure everything's staying clean. I had a I had a moment in the grocery store trying to find out where the baby wipes were. Turned out they were in the baby aisle. <laughs> I feel like a weirdo. Where are the baby wipes? Well, Do thought- you have a child? <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I thought it would be like, well, maybe they're because you know, baby wipes have become. They, I was maybe there's like personal wipes, right? You know, wet personal wet wipes, but not, yeah, that's not the case. All right, you guys want to do some weird things? Let's do it. Yes. Okay, I'm gonna count you in, Andrew. In <clears throat> three, two. Hello, and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Mean, joined by Justin Robert Young. Hello. And Mr. Bryce Castillo, the survivor. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm, I'm just glad that you can make that joke. I'm so <laughs> I'm so excited yeah. that that's where you want to come in on. So, so Bryce, Bryce is in Texas. Bryce, yes. what's the temperature right now? How are you doing? What's the temperature? Uh, the temperature right now here in uh, southwest Austin, Texas, is about 70 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> is is, okay. is, 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 is officially Confused. listed as sun's out, guns out. <laughs> That's right. We went from the longest period of below of consecutive below freezing temperatures, 144 hours, to a nice a nice spring day in the in the span of 24 hours. It, it, it's it's this this is such a crazy heel turn um, that that the weather did on the people of Texas, but. Uh, I think uh, we're, we're working through it. That's why Brian's not here. He's working on getting some water, getting some water here in the facility. So he won't join us today. Well, I'm glad you're able to make it. Very glad you have it here. It's yeah. it's one of those things that like there's cold and there's cold. Mm-hmm. There's uh, I need to turn on the heater to like uh, I need a bunch of husky pack dogs. Um, I need a fire <laughs> in my room and I'm never leaving again. Mm-hmm. It's it's a thing where you start to ration things you had not really considered that you might have to ration, right? Like, okay, I've got these blankets, but I need to cover the windows. So I can give up this blanket to cover up most of this window. And then, uh, you know, oh, well, you know, they're saying to conserve power, but I can run the air popper and I can heat up the bathroom while I, while I get changed or while I wash up. Um, it's, it's, uh, but, uh, I, 
I don't I don't know enough to get into the root causes of all this. I mean, of of the power thing. I do know the root cause of a lot of the things that ill the world. And if you were to travel back in time, if if you were to travel back in time from today to 1921, okay, and uh, go walk around, you know, cities and places like this, what would be some of the takeaways you would think about? In in 1921, um, mm-hmm. so that would be post post plumbing and post running water, right? Would would that be? Yeah, you got electricity, you got running yeah. water, you got the telephone. I mean, you can't you can't, you can't make bathtub gin without mm-hmm. uh, without some running water. Yeah, but if you were to visit homes and stuff, what would be your takeaway? Hmm. <clears throat> Probably food preservation, right? Food fe- food preser- preservation technology has changed quite a bit mm-hmm. since then right you know keeping you know you'd have you know, like those those guys that would sell you ice like yeah, a the big, big old ice block guy. of ice yeah mm-hmm. um cars and gas right it would probably be taken by i mean in just the value of currency at the time but but the, the dependency on on automobiles probably is is been changed wow, I, years. I would also even wonder what the feasibility I mean, because now cars are fairly cheap you can get a a a used car for for a fairly inexpensive price but i wonder at that point exactly what level of luxury a car would be just in general yeah not to mention mm-hmm. safety um mm-hmm. uh, well i mean at that i mean like but let's just let's just get a big old sheen of 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 safety to the entire process like you know going to eat a bagel is going to be more dangerous in 1921 than it is today just pulling out nails iron nails out of your bagel like it's nothing ah, i got the bones today they gave me the bone yeah, exactly. in bug bagel <laughs> so all of this yeah and i the thing that i thought about is we would take away we'd realize man everybody's poor everybody's poor because you get into a car and like, yeah, oh, the car's kind of neat, but like that car you buy, like, there's no safety features. There's nothing like this. You go to a downtown thing and you see the percentage of people are unemployed and you realize how many people live in boarding houses, how many people live in multifamily dwellings are pretty much the norm in certain areas. You go to bigger cities and stuff. Unemployed men would, you know, be living in, you know, staying in these big rooms with mats and stuff like just the quality of life compared to the average quality of life, particularly lower income, was way worse mm-hmm. than it is now. We'd be like, man, poor. You, you'd go look in schools, you go to the buildings and stuff. The amount of supplies are limited. A lot of things are limited. People don't have things. I'm not talking about just crap, but just things in general. And the quality of you know, buildings and stuff might be well made, but you know, you look at uh, the furniture and a lot of these other things. You know, most you know we're, we think about like, oh, they used to build things to last in the old days. No. Those are only, you only see the things that lasted. <laughs> yeah. It's a self fulfilling yeah. prophecy. Like, they built these buildings to last. I don't know. There were 30 other buildings here. They didn't last. And it's just that when people say stuff like that, like, how you can't test it just by that premise alone. This thing lasted. Therefore, they built things to last. That thing did. A lot of, you know, a lot of buildings and stuff. You look at like houses and stuff, like much thinner people pointed out our chat, no insulation, stuff like this. Like, you look at what goes into a house today versus then. And, you know, we might, oh, no, I went, we did this tour of this house, this historic house. Yeah, that was the nicest house in your city. That's why they preserved it. You know, <laughs> yeah. everything else was. You yeah. know, it, it's it's funny even, you know, to and, and I would only imagine that this extrapolates back 100 years, but even the last 25, and this is something that I've, I, I was focusing a lot in looking when we were looking for houses in Austin of, of just the difference between insulation, that if you're buying a house that has not been remodeled specifically with insulation in mind that was built any time before i mean hell even in, in in into the late 80s the differences in how houses were insulated was night and day and and it, it played out a friend of mine who was a, a fairly newer house in austin because of that construction never really got below like 50 degrees despite the fact that they had lost power and and at times heat in their house and it's like that just the construction of that was the difference between it getting far way, you know, closer to what it was outside right. versus it staying reasonably, you know, considering the, the, the disaster that had befallen them comfortable. And, and that's like, you know, th- that's something that we don't even think about. We just look at a house from the outside and we're like, a house is a house is a house, but it, it's not like that innovation is 
crucial. And and the other maybe the other obvious one here is like means of communication, right? I mean, if you ran out of if you ran out of power back then, uh, how would you find out what's even going on? How would you even know the status thing? I mean, even even today, even in the worst case scenario, you lose uh, water, heat, and power. You at least have a phone. That phone's going to last you a couple of hours at least, so you can figure out arrangements, right? If you're going to have uh, uh, you might have battery packs, right? I've got, I had a couple of, uh, USB charged battery bricks that would have lasted me probably a couple of days. Right. Uh, I mean, we, we just even have more means of, of dealing with the situation, staying more informed. Right. You know, uh, I, 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 if, if the TV or the power went out, well, I can look at Twitter. I could look at, uh, you know, any number of group chats. Yeah, I don't, they had, uh, I don't know when the first battery operated radios were around, um, but uh, they're pretty would have been rare in like 1921, anything like that remotely. But you did have telephone, but yeah, but it, you, uh, and that was, you know, as far as the power supply for that, but that, that would be extremely vulnerable too. But the point I want to make is imagine somebody visiting from 2121. Mm. How, 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 how do we look about barbaric us? to them? Well, we're not barbaric. Right. I mean, barbaric, <laughs> I would say more. Poor. We, we're Poor. Gonna, you're gonna, you look around and you think about like, I live in a nice apartment complex, nice area stuff, but you know there's still, you know, some places you know you get people leave stuff outside, whatever. You still have, you know, we have you know vulnerabilities here in California. Our electrical grid powers go in and out. It's 2021. We are in the friggin' future, and and it's not that we don't know how to solve these problems. It's just. We don't know. It's not the engineering's problem is a mystery to us. It is more eh, bureaucracy, all these other things that come up. Execution. Play. To get it, but, Execution. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we, we, you know, we, on some hands, some, on some one hand, we want to be very far forward about stuff. On other hand, we're sort of behind the times on things. And I've been a big advocate for nuclear. I don't need to go into that here, but how much that could help a lot. But even still, there's a lot of other little things that, like, you know, we have. You know, we have a huge, you know, L.A., we have a very huge homeless problem, which is directly fueled by, you know, there is a housing crisis, but also drugs and our inability to help people with mental health issues is probably the biggest driving factor of that. And you think of like, man, we're in a really, really rich society and there is very much a will to solve these problems, but we quite don't know how. Like we genuinely don't know. We will. One, we misdiagnose what the problem is. It's problem, number, you know, first problem. But that's the thing I think a lot about, like, you know, you drive through Skid Row in L.A., it's huge. It's like a mini town. And it's scary. And it, and it's this sort of thing. Of, it's scary to think about how people have to live in those conditions. And you're like, man, that's a symptom of our poverty. You know, it's a symptom of how poor we are, you know, as, you know, to be able to not be able to solve this problem. Do, do you think 100 years would be enough to. Uh, this uh, this this may be unba- un- un- unfounded or this 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 may not have as much legs but it just it just stick with me here a little bit america america just speaking about america america's big and we have a lot of space right just not where all the people are right do do you think 100 years would be enough enough time to build up new newer uh metro areas to continue to uh i don't know b- build out instead of up Right. Do you think that well, there's more? Do you think that there's density to I, add in the less dense Bryce, parts? The problem, the problem, a big problem we have, let's say in, Cal- in L.A. and California, parts of it with our with our homeless problem, isn't that there's no place to live in San Bernardino. It isn't that there ha- aren't houses for sale elsewhere or sure. whatever. It is there are people who there are people with real economic problems, but there it, drugs is a huge driving factor. It is a humongous driving factor for this reason. There's a reason when Hunter Biden wanted to go back on crack, he goes to the homeless camp. There's a reason you know where to go because it is a huge problem there. Why there's a problem there, what what causes that, that's another question beyond me, but that is a huge drive. And until you deal with that because that is why a lot of people choose to live sorry, be in these areas and live that there. You know, well, I, and, and I, I, I'm so, uh, sorry, I didn't mean that quite as a direct response to the home to the homeless issue. But I, I think about all of the things that overcrowding and and high density does to various metro cities. Right. Whether we're talking about transportation mm-hmm. or, um, you know, availability of housing or, uh, you know, available of of access to to metro areas, um, you know, people, you know, work downtown and then they live 60 minutes, 60 minutes away and are, you know, right. Like, uh, a, a little more broader to the, to the homeless mm-hmm. thing. I have, I, uh, don't know what, 
this what the solution is. Nor, to... nor, 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 nor do I think that we're going to solve the homelessness crisis here on the podcast. But I do think uh, where we are at now, if we're going to look at extrapolate a hundred years out and and understand that our progress is caused by pain. Like yeah. there are, you know, uh, the, the pain we feel can often be predictive of the breakthroughs for which we are going to define the next 50, 100 years. And if, and if we do say that part of that is, you know, if somebody were to come back and, and even walk through Oakland, walk through San Francisco, walk through LA, uh, that is something that people would, would look at and, and do say like, wow, that, that is a pain point. That is a problem. Uh, and so whether it be uh, solving these issues personally through some kind of mental health breakthrough, if there's one thing that I think no matter what, the pandemic has changed ir- absolutely for the better, it is telemedicine. I think the concept mm-hmm. of telemedicine, mm-hmm. removing, uh, 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 keep an eye on anybody who wants to put old rules back in place about not being able to contact the doctor and immediately shame them from the village, (laughs) uh, uh, remove them from polite society, because that is something that I think breaking down the access to, uh, uh, health, right. And, and, and democratizing that idea, breaking it outside of a physical, you got to be here to to interact with it way that's a revolutionary mm-hmm. concept and if what we're really talking about on some level with things like the homelessness population is catching somebody at a point where you know a, a, a health intervention can really change the course of somebody's life before you get into the throes of drug addiction or or, or at, at mm-hmm. the first point when you are able to to maybe pull somebody out of it and the difference is uh, I have the will to do it on my phone. I don't have the will to go physically to a doctor to get a referral to another doctor and expose my shame multiple times. Like that to me is, is like, I, I think if we, if we go a hundred years in the future, the concept, and this gets into a, yet another political landmine issue, but the concept of our healthcare, I feel like is going to look radically different because i think it's gonna well, look radically and, different in, in 10 years and just Absolutely. just in that that what's what's and i say that's then that gets back because it's the driver of these things it's pointing out chat rooms after reinforcing like we we stigmatize like oh well they're just there for drugs i don't mean at all like you have if you're dealing with healthcare issues and you don't have any normal way to treat with it drugs become a coping way they come with coping if you're dealing with severe issues you know it, it is it's sometimes it's better than nothing because you're not getting the help you need and help is ex- it is ridiculously expensive when you look at like and we have a very predatory system for drug treatment by the way too which is more about getting bodies into clinics in some cases and billing them and hoping they come back later a lot of things are broken and, and a part of the way we treat people and we look at we categorize like well they're a drug user so that's different than these people about homes it's like there is a vicious cycle things reinforce each other and like justin said the more we can lower the cost and make these things more accessible better so yeah. much better and destigmatize and just destigmatize this yeah, yeah. F- faster is a big part of it well and you know to, to bring it back to you know this past week um uh, a, a buddy of mine uh uh got hurt he got hurt in the middle of the the cold storm and uh he was able to do telemedicine and the doctor could say hey yeah it looks like you fractured your rib um can't really do anything for you now. Really wouldn't have been able to do anything for you if you came in. If you got painkillers, take them and see how how you're doing in the morning. Um, and and that's something that that he could do from home, um, versus you know braving you know black ice and and harsh weather and 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 road conditions uh, to to get you know even a, even a, a a basic like let me just at and, least check on at and, least check on you. And that is something in some places was illegal, mm-hmm. illegal before, uh, uh, before, you know, the, the, the pandemic, you know, there were, there were certain areas in which like actual laws had to be suspended for us to have those, uh, uh kind of uh, abilities. And then the next level beyond that is us figuring out, Hey, you want to know what around the world, there's probably a doctor that can be there to talk to you for fairly cheap at any moment. 
as long as you have an internet connection and like you, like you mentioned, Bryce, I mean, imagine a world in which, uh, uh, I, I don't know the circumstances in which your friend hurt themselves, but I presume it was on some level related to the fact that it was, everything was it was water related. And, he yeah, had, he had a he had a burst pipe, and so he he slipped right. He slipped so in he his slipped. own home. Yeah. yeah, I mean, hell, before I left, the the uh, if if anybody who's watching live, you see through the window behind Bryce is the the porch for the the property. That porch was totally frozen over. Yeah, totally frozen over, and was. A, a a broken ankle, a broken rib, a broken arm waiting to happen with a bunch of people that were that that did not have snow boots, including me. <laughs> I had running shoes because that's all I brought to Austin because I presumed that that was all I was going to need. Yeah. Uh, and 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 to yeah, I mean we're 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 coming up with more and more examples of why this is a a, a step forward, but I think. God, it, it, we're just thinking of physical trauma in the moment, and we're not even understanding, uh, you know, like 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 Andrew said, lowering the barrier, lowering the stigma, finding. I mean, uh, uh, when when you're talking about these sorts of issues, health, mental health, uh, uh, addiction related, they start very small, and they just get reinforced and reinforced and reinforced and reinforced and reinforced, and anything that can help alleviate that cycle can begin unraveling it and, and, and begin maybe taking it in, in, in another direction. And that's something that I certainly hope continuing going a hundred years from now, we're going to look back and be like, Oh God, like it's going to be like little house on the prairie that like, but you had to physically go to a doctor around you. And then he had to physically give you a, yeah. a permission slip. He didn't to, just to step bring in your to... Da Vinci machine and it full body scanned you and it didn't have any radiation or five G. Exactly. Right. Yeah. yeah. Or even, I mean, like think, because we can think of a world in which this stuff is, is feasible. Like we can think of a, a, a machine where you could even have shots administered that would be sent to you you know, via Amazon and plug into a cartridge or something mm. like 3D, that. 3D printed vaccines. I think it's, it's important too. is like try and understand. There's so many of the reasons why we don't have these things is because of competing interests. And we brought up telemedicine and somebody in chat room said, Oh, it's because of insurance companies. I don't know that. I know the AMA and the doctors uh, groups fought against it for years because the fear is if all of a sudden and certain medical care groups, like if people own some hospitals were against it because the problem was, and I live in Los Angeles County, if I could get a lot of my medical services from some other state where it's cheaper, then they lose. And that's who is fine. Insurance companies generally love this because it lowers the cost. I mean, they're not gonna lower your premium, they're just gonna make more profit by using things like this. It's often, sometimes the people you think, oh, it would be in their interest, like, no, it's not because they're competing. AMA has changed a bit, like the pandemic and whatnot, they changed the policies about these things and people change. Sometimes you really have to sort of look at and see like what is, you know, who who loses and sometimes have a valid argument. You know, sometimes have an argument like, no, we're worried about the quality of care or whatever, which I think I don't know. I I've I've I don't I've never found a physician that I'm like, ah, oh, I'm totally comfortable with this person. I really think they are. I found that with I found a dentist like that in Florida who I loved was super smart. And that's part of the problem in medicine is that you go to this one expert who's supposed to be an expert on everything, which is hard. And you, they tell you, yeah. and you're like, oh, okay, I guess, I guess so. And, and if you don't have any you know, reason to be skeptical or believe that they might not have it right, you know, for a lot of people, I mean, a lot of people who even, you know, go to doctors and say, well, you're, I don't believe you or I don't like you, aren't, aren't empowered to, you know, get a second opinion or, or able to do that. Right. Yeah. Um, I, I think, a, you know, and then we can just kind of graze on this. Uh, we can just graze by this one, but I think a lot of what we're talking about in terms of, mental health treatment um, and and uh, the possibilities for progress there. I think there are probably a lot of parallels you can say about uh, maybe the way the criminal justice system works in America, especially in terms of uh, prisons, um, um, in, in terms of, uh, I don't know, what, what, what life is like for people in the incarceration system, you know, uh, uh, Right now, I mean, I, I think if this, I think a hundred years from now, we're going to look back at even some of the recent things in terms of uh, getting rid of books and charging prisoners to get tablets or, you know, try, continuing to charge them to use the phone. 
Like, I think we're going to look at that stuff and, and go, that's, that's exploitative more than it's exploitative mm-hmm. of the poor. Um, you know, I, I would hope that that's something that we make, make some progress in, uh, however you feel about w- where the, the, the oh, criminal justice I, I, system is right now. I, 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 there is a huge problem with our prison systems because one is often we put people who aren't violent in with people who are violent. We mix sort of the way we treat certain things. We are, uh, we have that we have exploited systems like you said of like basic services and the cost to sort of get that and the other side of it is that um many of our prisons are corrupt the, the amount of fraud that gets committed from within inside prisons because prisoners like you look at number of fraud cases that come in there because somebody has access to a phone they should not have or whatever and you look like how do these things get in there in some states maybe this one um they the the prison guard union we're able to get it get it uh, a bill uh, killed that was going to make it mandatory to X-ray anything that they brought into the prisons. Mm. So we don't we and you have a pipeline inside of there. In some of these cases, you have people who work in the prisons are complicit with this and enabling this. It's not sometimes you have like you know some dude in there gets a cell phone, is able to do some fraud, do some other stuff, or they've access to whatever kinds of things. There's a huge amount of this in the drugs and things like this coming into prisons. Like there's a huge, you know, people go into prison sometimes to get hooked on drugs. There's just an availability of that there. We're doing a huge disservice. See, I believe I'm a very much a law and order person, but you need to be treated like a human throughout that process. And if you're yeah. put into a system that makes it worse or gives you worse habits or whatever, that's on us. Yeah. And that's 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 and we don't know we don't we, we don't want to criticize teachers. We don't want to criticize people who run prisons because these are jobs none of us want to do. So mm-hmm. nobody wants to criticize them. And uh, that's problematic. And it's, it's a, one of the biggest untold sort of stories that really is the, the entire economy's inside prison and how corrupt it is in many places and both go- government run and privately run prisons. I have, you know, as much as I am a free market person, I'm like, I don't know if we need to delegate everything to private companies. I mean, even yeah. b- parts of that system that, you know, we might consider, I don't know, canonical, right? Like, I think the way we look at prison labor uh, will probably change significantly in a hundred years, right? Um, well, I, I, well, I mean, we don't. Where Where do you think I, we are now? I, I don't. I, <laughs> if we need to get into that. I feel like we're on a we're on a we're on a tangent on a tangent on a tangent. I, yeah, I, I don't know enough to to say, but I I just I don't know. I think I think I don't know. I don't know. I mean, we don't have mandatory. You have places where they do programs in prisons where you can work to make money. Okay. The pri- what they get paid or whatever like this is problematic. But also, it's like it's not there's there's not a huge demand for prison labor, which is why the pri- the pay is like very low. But you're not generally compelled to do that. As far as I know, I'm even mistaken on that because we we changed that years ago, and there was a lot of reforms that were for the good. Some maybe weren't so much for the good, although they seem that way. Um, hmm. You and know, and I, I, I legitimately don't yeah. know. I mean, most of what yeah. I know about life in prison is from Origins of the New Black. And so, that is <laughs> obviously. Yeah. Well, it's Bryce, a... well, they we're going to announce a new a new podcast we're going to be doing here. Uh, Bryce goes to prison. Oh, yes, to do we are. Yeah. Detailed investigation. Very yes. excited. Uh, Bryce, Bryce locked uh, up. Yeah, we've uh, put a pound of cocaine in your trunk, and the cops are on their way. So, uh, hey, you just... got a half pound of cocaine in here. You're going <laughs> to jail, buddy. <laughs> You're going to jail. <laughs> uh, oh. And like Orange is the New Black, uh, the real lessons will be the friends you met along the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, all the friends that we've made along the way, uh, well, out of all of them, some of them can be found over at patreon.com slash weird things. Isn't that right, Justin? Of course, uh, patreon.com slash weird things is where you support this show with your money. Now, you might ask, well, what do I get for that money? Well, I got a good uh, uh, a bargain here for you. Not only do you get the satisfaction of supporting your favorite show that has such tremendous range discussing <laughs> news of the weird and and uh, uh, prison reform <laughs> and uh, uh, whether or not we're we're building too fast or too slow throughout our, uh, our, our American society, flashing forward 100 years in the past and in the future, but also you get your custom RSS feed where you're able to get our after things podcast before anybody else get early access to a, uh, uh, I think a very rare and amazing community uh, where we, we share all the numbers, all the experiences about our own careers as uh, entrepreneurs and content makers and uh, uh, men of industry in this bizarre time we live in head on over there patreon.com slash weird things all right gentlemen i have a, an experiment i want you to do right now i want okay. you to pull up uh pull up a browser pull up google okay Got yep 
type in Mars and then Mars. Perseverance. Perseverance. Yeah, Thank God that auto completed. Yeah, let's see here. Uh, oh, it's got fireworks. Look at that. Oh. That's cute. <laughs> Why? Why do we have? Oh, yes. We landed. Woo! Yeah, that uh, that was over. That was over the weekend, right? Um, but more yes. footage is, is coming out. Friday. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so this was. Mars yeah. Yeah, but, this, 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 this was. Oh, hold, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Every, I think you guys have all cut. You have all cut out on me. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Uh, I can I cannot hear you. Oh, okay. Hold on, everybody. We're gonna take a quick pause. Can Can you hear us, Andrew? I can hear you. Okay. Just yeah. For some reason, Justin. So. Uh, oh, did it, you close it, it, your browser with the Opal? No. Okay. No, I didn't. Uh, apparently, the uh, fireworks from Chrome, uh, uh, from Google, crashed my browser. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Should have used which Safari. Then crashed the, they, then crashed the Opal. So there we go. Oh man. Yeah. Uh, we so can land a rover on Mars, but <laughs> I know. So yeah, so this so so this landed on Friday, but uh, uh the the footage that we are discussing at the time of our recording came out a few hours ago, right? Yeah, they've been yeah, they've been releasing bit by bit new photos, new footage. Uh and it's and it's an incredible achievement. Do you you look at you know, we sent we sent a rocket ship millions of miles through space you know over a year to get there or uh time to get there and then uh actually that was launched on july 2020 so it took uh seven eight months to get there i would make more sense anyhow took this took launch last year finally made it and then has this heat shield so as it crashes into the mars atmosphere dissipates heat separates and all of a sudden sends this whole unit with a sky crane and all that, which is just insane. The most crazy thing. We've did that before and it works so well. We did it again, which, you know, then lowers this thing. If you, you have to appreciate the size of perseverance. It is as big as a car. It's huge. It's literally, you know, basically just rocketing, not just a car into the Mars, you know, the ors, you know, the range of the Mars orbit, but to actually send a thing there, an entire spacecraft that is designed to lower another roving unit on there is insane. Yeah. And we did it. It's bigger than before. And the photos look great. And this thing's semi-autonomous, which is cool. So it'll actually be able to control itself and do like some predetermined exploration. So it doesn't have to wait, you know, to get, you know, every 15 minutes or whatever the distance is between Earth and Mars at that point to get signal. Wow, and uh, it. Uh, I'm surprised we got footage this fast. Maybe, maybe that's that's an evolution of of communications that um, has has evolved over the years. But I mean, this this happened a few days ago, and we're seeing footage, really, really stunning uh, resolution footage of of uh, the the rover landing already. Yeah, what we're able to do now is that. Uh, partially is as if you're you're sending back image by image by image you can then now then play them back in real time which is helpful so you know we don't we don't have like live video feeds from there yet but you, what we're able to do though is to send you know a bunch of you know slowly download a bunch of you know frames and then put them back together and get effectively video well wow. it is video that's amazing yeah that's that's uh, incredible and so this was only launched last year then yeah july that's amazing. And so it got there in less than a year and we're, we're getting pictures and videos back that w was that at like one of the, 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 the shortest windows of when we could launch something from earth and get it to Mars that fast. Yeah. It's like, you know, every like 34 months or whatever the period is, is when you could do that. So it was launched within that window and then uh, was able to make, you know, the journey there during that period of time, which and that's that's pretty, you know. Sometimes like sometimes they go faster, sometimes it goes slower. It depends, but I think they launched that on an atlas, uh, and it's it's cool. I mean, it's, it's you know, often we're used to hearing about stuff going to like the you know, like oh, something just passed Neptune or whatever, and that takes years and years. So uh, this so is just kind of incredible. I, I wanted to share this because I I thought we might have talked we we might we're going to talk about uh, something that came out. What was this on the nineteenth, which was um, fake. A faked video and audio um, that was circulating 
about the sound of Mars. Um, this is this is the fake thing. Apparently, people put together a, a large panorama that the pr the other Mars rover had done, and put together some wind soundscape. But apparently, uh, we now have the hottest new SoundCloud rapper in the game, the <laughs> Mars rover. Uh, first, Mars sounds from Mars filters out rover self noise. I hear nothing. Oh, you don't hear? It? Yeah, there's just, there's just that. Yeah, just, just a like a very, very subtle deep wind. rumbling. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, I I saw that video too. Like the sound of Mars. I'm like, well, that doesn't really compute that much because there's such thin, like one percent atmosphere at that level. To have any kind of sense of sound, you have to do so much kind of signal processing, whatever, to create the sense of a sound. And I was like, this doesn't. I didn't. I didn't like you know retweet it or anything because like I was I was confused. <laughs> yeah, so I'm like, you know, it's not like you just put a microphone out there and like, hey, listen to the sound of Mars. It's like it's like, <laughs> yeah, Andrew, Andrew that was muted <laughs> talking. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, um, that's crazy. Okay, so what is uh, uh, Perseverance is now going to go through all of the uh, things that they have uh, determined that it will do. Uh, what is on that list? Well, the most important thing is launching a helicopter. That's right. It's got this damn thing's got a helicopter on it too. Got a helicopter. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> that's right. So do 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 we know when that's going to be? Is that like an immediate thing? Uh, I don't know. I just some of the comments said so it'd be like a desert with a light wind. No, like a desert with almost no wind whatsoever at all because there's no friggin' air. There's there. no atmosphere. It's 1%. Yeah. yeah, it's one percent. You know, it's like so. But like, but you're like, okay, Andrew. Then how do we have a helicopter there? I don't know. Magic. Um, <laughs> no, there's enough atmosphere there that you can actually. There's enough atmosphere, and if you 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 have to spin. Here's the way it works. There is atmosphere there, and there is wind. There is sound on Mars, like that very clear sound. But it's just it would be like one percent or two percent the volume of what we're used to here. There's no one there to hear as it. Far, yeah, well, there's a <laughs> rover there. As far as the helicopter is concerned, this is the way. This is the way I had to look this up before because I read like a paper years ago. Like, could you make an airplane work on Mars? I'm like, oh no, there's not enough atmosphere. Like, actually, you could. You just got to spin your propellers a lot faster and move faster because there is still air there. And we do have airplanes that fly at very, very high altitudes where the air is very thin. The key is you got to move very fast. In the case of this helicopter, it's got these uh, two counter rotors that spin extremely, really, 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 really fast, right? So the rotors are counter rotating, spinning very fast. And it's very Plus small. The of Mars. It, it, it's yeah, very small. It's not a huge helicopter with the, uh, the cabin and everything. It looks like a little, uh, it's got a little <laughs> shiny a box and legs. It's a, yeah, it's a drone, you know, it's, but it, it's the other advantage is that you have 30, you know, 40% of the gravity. So you're much lighter. So your battery packs, you get a big weight reduction there, which is one of the reasons which makes it somewhat feasible is like, okay, not as much atmosphere, but it doesn't weigh as much. So you can push things a lot faster, whatever. So the rotors spend at 2,400 rotations per minute. So, which is pretty freaking fast. Mm -hmm. And in theory, we've never actually tested a helicopter in a environment with gravity like this wow. we'll see that's insane and and i'm so looking forward to the uh, uh dank drone footage that <laughs> we can now uh, uh insert into any you know rap music video the travel like I'm, the travel influencer youtuber with the big drone footage. exactly yeah you've got baja and you've got molly and then you've got mars <laughs> yeah, mars <laughs> Yeah. Oh my God. So busted. Like those old, like, <laughs> oh, you're in Cabo. Who cares? Right. Like, like, no, you really want Mars. Mars. The greatest travelogue of all time. So the, here's the schedule. The drone, the small drone helicopter is planned for deployment in the first 30, 30 souls, as we say in space, you know, about 31 Earth days after the landing of the Perseverance rover, uh, which was Friday. It is planned to make the first powered flight on any planet beyond Earth and is expected to fly up to five times during its 30-day test campaign early in the rover's mission as its primary technology demonstration. Each flight is planned to be at an altitude ranging from 10 to 16 feet above the ground 
In up to 90 seconds per flight, it could travel as far as 160 feet downrange and then back to the starting area. It can use autonomous control during its short flights, although flights will be telerobotically planned and scripted by controllers at JPL. It will communicate with the Perseverance rover directly after each landing. If it works, it's expected NASA could build on the design for future Mars aerial missions. Yeah, this is this is really big. Very, very, very big. If works, because it opens up an entirely new way to explore Mars, and we might be sitting future missions which are just payloads of drones. Yeah. Yeah. We could. Oh we my could, God! We could yeah, map Mars. Multiple. Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, uh, dummy boy. Question: How is this communicating with Earth? How is Perseverance communicating with Earth? Like, like, what is not, the the? Yeah. Not not a dumb question at all. So we have in orbit around Mars, as far as I understand, Mar uh, NASA has what's called its deep space network. It's just sort of its way of communicating to basically like missions. Some space probes aim their stuff straight back at Earth, and we have big telescopes on Earth to, to receive them. In the case of like Mars Perseverance, a mission like this is we have there, and then we have a satellite in orbit around Mars, which is then capable of re retransmitting and sending things back, can be the case of that. So. Uh, that's my understanding of what we're doing is I forget which, uh, one of the orbiters, but again, it gets sent to stuff up to there, hmm. but that's a okay. bigger thing too. Is so we, so we, building... so we, we, yeah, we, we, we have a network that is, is built for this kind of relay of, of information that eventually gets back to us and we can get back to the perseverance. Yeah. Yeah. So they have, it's called the Mars. This is the Mars relay network. Okay. So, uh, Perseverance, they have the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, we have the Mars Odyssey and uh, MAVEN. And so we have several of these satellites there that are then, we have like Goldstone, which is on Earth, which is a facility there, it's talks to them. So basically it's relayed. Okay. Uh, satellites, right? From, it's, it's bouncing around. Yeah, but, but, but that, that's the satellite system that has to be in place for this to work. Wow. Yeah, like early on, um, yeah, that's sort of what f makes it a lot easier to be able to do that. And so basically, you know, the rover sending its little information and stuff up to one of those satellites, and then those satellites are then, you know, transmit it back mm -hmm. to our Earth network. And how how cool is it that, yeah, we got satellites on Mars. That's amazing. Mars. So, all right, let me ask you this. Uh, does any other nation have stuff on Mars, or, or, or is that, a, is that a, an, an American's game right now? Um, ESA, uh, I mean, they had the ESA has the ESA trace gas orbiter, which is orbiting Mars. The record of their other countries have stuff on Mars. Oh, they have not been able to land it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And that was like for the longest time we had, uh, you know, the conspiracy theory was, cause it was like, it was like one out of three, like our records gotten much better, but it was like, like one out of three things just, uh, you landed know, collided yeah. with mars or even made like even in you know, orbit emissions you know huh. i mean it's I'm looking at the uh, you know space is kind of you know justin space is kind of big you know sometimes you're gonna miss you know it's a you know a one degree difference from new york to los angeles can end you up in washington you know that's that's the fact i mean yeah yeah look i i I'm 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 just kind of amazed, and that's that's one of those things where I don't know whether or not my view is just myopic because we're going to be a NASA focused, you know, media and 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 everything. That like I don't know if like China's got rovers or whatever, or the ESA or something no. has has rovers, but uh, that's pretty awesome because we've got a bunch of them right now. We're launching helicopters and stuff like stunting on these hoes. I, I want to send to Bryce. I'll send you this photo here. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a. Uh... This is the European uh, Mars lander. And again, we, we, I don't want to pick on anybody because like we've had, it is hard and we've had issues with, we lost one of our Mars programs to a uh, math error, a metric to, you know, imperial conversion no! error. Oh, oh no. So we, we, I'm not, it's hard. So any, I'm like, it's not like, oh, look at this country. How love we, we figured, you know. Had, forgot how to convert and lost a thing. So that was a photo of me when I was at JPL in front of a, a replica of the uh, 2020 rover, and you saw how big it is. Mm -hmm. It was uh, huge. Oh yeah, ooh, we got, yeah. Mars has got some skid marks on it, huh? Oops. Uh -oh. Yeah. This is which yeah, is that's the, the Skya Pirelli. 
Is that Shepparelli. Like Shepparelli. Oh, anyway. um, from 2016, it looks like that crashed. Wow. Ooh. And that was one of ours? Uh, Europe's. No, that was the European. Oh, it was Europe's. Europe's. Oh, no. But we sent them photos from our Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. <laughs> hey, guys. Just wanted to let yeah, you know. I, I, I saw that. this. I, I saw this. I don't know if you knew about this. Yeah. I just wanted to make Happens sure. Happens to the best of us. No, we we'll just keep yeah. it between us. God, we're no, so like, yeah, annoyed. Back at, tell us what happened in 1998. You couldn't tell the difference between a meter and a yard. Like, oh, shut up. All right. It's hard. Mars shut is up. hard. Shut, right, up. Just like, shut up. <laughs> uh, kudos. It's just, I mean, it's amazing that we've got, um, there's some really cool, there's some sample return missions, whatever. I think it was, we talked, it was a, it was a JAXA, the Japanese space agency did, you know, brought back some first samples from that asteroid, which is cool. Like, I mean, it's space, and they're doing, you know, amazing stuff's going on all over. You know? Oh yeah. Yeah. It, I mean, it, I think we're, 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 we're in a thrilling time for space exploration. I don't, and not to get too much, but like we've, we've had, we had a lot of people cheering this on. And then there was a counter hashtag, like uh, what else we could spend Mars money on. I forgot what the hashtag was about, you know, people who are wondering why we're spending money on that. And let me, I think that's a perfectly valid question. I think it's a perfectly valid question to say, why are we spending money on this instead of that? I would also say, let's go talk about like the billions of dollars we spent on naval ships that we're never going to use that we knew we didn't need. Sure. Let's address, you know, Fighter the, planes. You know ha ha yeah, half the budget we spent on fraud, fraudulent COVID claims in California, the $10 billion in fraudulent COVID claims in California because we rushed through something in a way we shouldn't have there. We're warned about it. That's half the budget of NASA. Like, I'm like, yes, you're free. Please criticize this, but let's come talk about the, you know, how about that billion dollar SLS tower that none of these people even know exists, whatever. And that's, yeah, that's my issue. I, 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 all I would say is that this government has a lot of money. It spends a lot of money. And if we're looking to rank things of bang for our buck, this is a pretty high return <laughs> for, 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 for whatever it has gone into it. Uh, we, we, we only hope and pray that all of our investments in all of the things that we invest in and spend money on has the level of measurable return that, that we got from that we got from this. This is something that I think you know, if, if, if you talk about flashing forward a hundred years, this is the kind of building block that will likely define the next century. Like if, if, if we yeah. are thinking about humanity entering an, an extra planetary age. So, and I would say, I, again, I'm very pro this, but I also want to be devil's advocate. There is, um, you know, we we're like, oh, what happened? Why didn't we go back to the moon? My girlfriend is asking, why don't we go back to the moon? It cost us a billion dollars in 1970 dollars per astronaut to put them on the moon. That's why is you know at the height at the height of the Apollo program was something like 23, 24 percent of our already exploding budget. It was hugely expensive and not a sustainable thing, particularly when you're trying to save the benefits. We say, well, look at all these products we got. There have been a lot of benefits from there, but I would devil's out like. Yeah, and I think if we put a bunch of research into material science, we, for ten percent of that money funding to you know uh, engineering colleges and schools like that, we might get more. It's to me that's not as strong. And some of the people I know, some of these science advocates were you know yelling at the dumbs for like, don't you understand? And I'm like, um, we can't just say my cathedral is going to be really awesome. That can't be our argument. You know that like yeah, but look at the yeah. stained glass windows, and, and and it can't just be that like we'll get some benefit later on. I think you have to sort of say this is how it has direct and whatever. And these things do happen now. We do see the benefits from these things directly. And we're seeing as the privatization of space, which I think is a, a very good thing, because then it means we are incentivized to do this and you know, that we see real reward. Yeah. And it's cheaper. We can do it more. We can and, and, yeah. and we can keep, again, that, that bang for the buck uh, in a better proportion. Yeah. And, and those yeah. innovations, you know, if SpaceX comes up with a cheaper way to do it, you know, down the line, those things, th those things spread across those industries. Right. Um, you know, we could be looking at, uh, you know, uh, the price of NASA doing something also coming down as SpaceX oh, continues to bring their prices down. I mean, well, we've already we've already we've already seen it with with the difference between I mean. When we started, one of the canonical issues that we talked about on this podcast from from uh, oh so many years ago was the kind of fork in the road of what NASA's path 
to kind of space and Mars were going to be and what was happening in private rocketry and the stuff that we were passionately told was impossible, uh, including reusing rockets, including landing your, 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 your rockets are now like normal ass stuff. Like I think we all have friends that have kids that will just, the, the entirety of their lives will just be like, oh, no, yeah, rockets are those things that take off and land, you know, like a plane. They're basically like a plane that goes you that, that, that takes you to space. And that's something that, again, when, when there are episodes of this podcast where we were being passionately told, yeah, eh, there's a lot of stuff here, almost certainly not possible. Let me give you a choice quote who I, I respect immensely, but he had kind of a very different view of I thought where NASA could have gone, and that was um, – uh, Charlie Bolden, who was a four-time astronaut, NASA administrator, and he was NASA administrator prior to, uh, well, uh, years ago. So anyhow, 2014, because I'm trying to, can't, I can't remember who's the acting administrator right now. So yeah. uh, anyhow, he, 2014, he was asked by uh, uh, Eric Berger, who's a great reporter at Ars Technica, covers space stuff, about why NASA was investing so much money in the SLS rocket, which we've talked about, when SpaceX was using its own funds to develop the lower-cost Falcon Heavy rocket. This was Charles Bolden's statement. Charles Bolden's statement. Let's be very honest. We don't have a commercially available heavy lift vehicle. The Falcon 9 Heavy may someday come about. It's on the drawing board right now. SLS is real. Well, and what what, what year was this? Um, this was recent, um, wasn't it? Um, 2014, 2014. Then 2016. 2016 asked again, if you talk about launch vehicles, we believe our sponsor donation is to take care of things that normal people cannot do or don't want to do, like large launch vehicles. I'm not a big fan of commercial investment large launch vehicles just yet. Hmm. Uh so you gotta play it close know, to your chest. Yeah, you gotta you know, I, um, I especially when you're especially when you're hiding lobbyist money. That's <laughs> something that you want to keep yeah. close to your chest. Okay. He yeah. said remember, he said recklessly throwing around Jesus. an accusation. <laughs> <laughs> SLS was supposed to launch in 2017. 2017 was the launch date. And SLS was designed, oh, we'll use some former shuttle parts, all this. We'll just throw this thing together. No problem. Uh, and you look through the history. We bash on that a lot. But I'm like, 2017. It's 2021 yet. They've got to do another test because it failed the last engine test. they got to do another engine test by like the end of this month before they can even send it to the next facility for the next stage. It ain't launching this year. It ain't launching this year. Mm -hmm. Best case scenario, if it fails this test, it may never launch. It's it, best case scenario, it's going to launch in 2022. That's five years, five years, which is, and I won't even get into the James Webb Space Telescope and other stuff that's cost billions of dollars. And that's like my uh -huh. my friends are a pro, like, yeah, everything NASA does is great. And people are like, we need to increase the funding for NASA, which I'm all for, but I'm like, I'll tell people, like, yeah, we should we should spend as much as the ESA does, right? The Europeans spend on their space. And people are like, I don't know. Do they spend more? No, no, way less. We spend more on our space agents than any other country in the world, you know, for purely civilian stuff. But and I'm all for more. It's just if we spend it smarter. Mm -hmm. Sure. But, yeah. And I like yeah. I like I like where we're at now. I, I, I feel like uh, uh, we're going to have a lot of options. I mean, hell, I think it's been since we last talked on this show because we took the week off with the um, with, with, with the freeze. But, right. you know, Jeff Bezos actively, uh, uh, you know, handing over the reins over at Amazon. And then sure enough, all of a sudden, with, with uh, a lot of the rumors being that he wants to focus more heavily on Blue Origin, uh, uh, we saw some hints that they might be closer to a, a larger breakthrough than than we might have previously thought, right? I sent you, yeah, I sent to, I was joking, because we did on the podcast, we talked about, about how the next rocket they have is the new Glenn. That is going to be their orbital class rocket. And I had made the comment, because Brian was asking, like, how far it was, like, I said, I don't know, but they're so secretive. It wouldn't surprise me if literally the next day they popped it up on a launch pad. And then literally four days later, I see an image gets leaked from Canaveral, which shows part of the new Glenn rocket sticking out of a facility. Now, I don't know how much of the rest of it's there, but clearly they're, they're, there's physical hardware there. Yeah. But mm -hmm. there's hardware for SLS, too. So maybe I need to temper that. Well, I mean, all, all, all I know is that there's a lot of exciting stuff happening in in, yeah. in rocketry, and and it is tangible, tangible in a way that like you you look at what we used to excite ourselves in terms of space exploration, and it was by and large press releases. It was press releases and timeframes that we could 
yep. you know, say, well, well, only in five years or in 10 years, we'll be able to do blah, blah, blah. And now we, we measure our speed in uh, uh, advancements in rockets at, at like iPhone cycles. <laughs> we're like, <laughs> like every year we're looking at some new advancement and, and making things uh, more powerful, cheaper, and, and more reliable. just more accessible, more reliable. And it's 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 going to be exciting when we get to the point where NASA gets to do what it does best, which is incredible science. You know, we bag on stuff a mm -hmm. bit because we pay so much attention, but incredible science. The achievement, perseverance is an incredible piece of hardware, et cetera. The helicopter pushing the envelope a lot with that. And kind of they had to do something like that, too, because part of it is the when they have to go before senators and ask for like more funding, they kind of go like, well, how is this different than the last thing? Like, well, we looked at these rocks this time. And it's yeah. more than that, of course. But when you're trying to explain something to a senator, that is sort of the kind of the dog and pony show part of it. But once, you know, we talked about, I think, in a previous podcast, how there is part of the Artemis mission involved, or the Lunar Gateway is these, you know, there's uh, like three structures. Two of them are going to be launched on the Falcon Heavy. Previously, they were supposed to be launched on the SLS and mandated even by you know Congress. But that got changed. And so now Falcon Heavy gets to be used for that, and it's going to cost like, you know, like like 80 percent less or something much, much, much cheaper to be able to do it that way, which in theory, if we say, hey, we have this budget for NASA, let's not lower this budget. But instead of spending, you know, a three or four billion of this on SLS programs and maintenance every year, let's use this on more Mars rovers and more incredible missions elsewhere. We get more science. Yes. And that's that's huge huge yeah so uh gentlemen picks yeah we can do picks indeed I, I got a pick uh over uh over these past two weeks i had a lot of time at home it turns out <laughs> oh why is that bryce decided it's a me time <laughs> it's just sort of like yeah, it's sit like a down staycation and uh i i had a chance to play a video game to start and to finish a video game that uh uh has it's it's been out for a little while they just recently uh re-released it for the new next generation consoles and uh it's free on the playstation plus service this month um and so i finally got a chance to dive into uh control uh the new ultimate edition uh, uh i i don't expect either of you guys know control but uh justin and andrew i'm sure you've heard of um like the scp foundation stuff yeah I sure, I have. of course uh, that no. that is uh for, for the listeners who may not know, um that's this online um I don't know writing community where they have imagined up this um you know this big government agency that uh, keeps track of of um, mysterious and supernatural items and they you know redact stuff and they they try to build out um kind of this this shared mythology of of of. Uh, I don't know, unusual objects in, in our reality that bend our reality. And uh, c Control kind of takes that idea and some of those aesthetics. Uh, so the idea is that you are, um, uh, you're a, a woman going to the Federal Bureau of Control, um, which is kind of a clandestine secret government organization that is kind of like SCP, charged with finding and um, uh, securing and containing um, objects of power, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, these these weird items that, for whatever reason, have various, um, uh, I don't know, ab abilities. And it, when she walks in, she finds out there's been a, a, a an invasion by this unknown force called the Hiss, and it's invading people and it's taking them over. And um, she like immediately, like the first thing that happens is you walk in and the the director shoots himself in the head and everyone says cool you're the director now lady <laughs> and uh you go around trying to you know solve all the problems and figure out why you know what's happening how do you contain it i i gotta say that the the thing that really gets me the most more than the gameplay even is the storytelling i think that they do a really good job of mixing um mixing like cinematic um uh storytelling um methods um with alongside you know the in-game stuff right uh, there's there's all there's text logs everywhere talking about uh, the different artifacts and the different incidents that have happened and how the how the bureau responds to it. I, I think that's part of what makes control kind of 
very distinct from this SCP stuff where it's like there is there is actually a pretty human story. This is really looking at like what does it look like to work uh, for, at a place like this? Yeah. yeah. Um, and, uh, and it, it's also, I think it's like just scary enough. I'm not really good with scary stuff and it's just scary enough where it's, where it's, it's pretty thrilling. I, I think it's really cool. Um, and, um, they have a lot of accessibility stuff. You know, if you find that you are getting, uh, if you're getting beat down, they've got all sorts of options. You can fine tune how, uh, how many handicaps you give yourself, um, if you want to just enjoy the story, I, I, I think it's I think it's a really interesting kind of singular video game experience. So uh, Control, um, it's been out for a few years, but that Ultimate Edition is now out on the next gen consoles. Apparently engrossing enough that you can forget the fact that society has crumbled around you. <laughs> uh, you know, a little bit. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That we is found a... him there, frozen with the controller in his hand. <laughs> You want to know what I'm? I'm just realizing now that we really screwed up uh, uh, giving you the nickname Icy Pricey on <laughs> uh, on, <laughs> on Night Attack two weeks ago. Uh, you, know, I, I would like to issue. A, I would like to issue a, a, an apology. Uh, all right, uh, I'm uh, I'm over the moon about Wandavision, but uh, I don't know if if, if uh, we want to expend more conversation there. I I will say that. <laughs> We are uh, now out of uh, Kim's convenience, so we needed a new show, my wife and I, and we have uh, uh, decided to settle on HBO Max's Raised by Wolves. <gasps> yes. Raised by Wolves is so good. So how far into Raised by Wolves are you? I think we are five episodes in. Okay, so you're, um, you're, about, you're, you're halfway through. Yeah, but uh, it's great. I'm gonna file this one under G for great. <laughs> you very you, much. You watched yeah. this, Andrew, right? I was my pick, uh, like months ago. Thank you, Bryce. Yeah, I think when it was <laughs> when it was you. first airing. Yeah. yeah, no, it was. I'm uh, like, hey, um, everybody, check this thing out. It's so different, cool. I think a couple nights or a couple days in a row, I'm like, this is really cool. I'm like, no, Andrew, it sucks. We're never getting off to this quest. <laughs> Everything you like is garbage. I think we classically um, we say, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we just started booing in unison. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, look, it's it has that great. Battlestar Galactica quality where if you stripped out all the sci-fi it would just be a great frontier western mm -hmm. you know like you could you could do a version of this where you know you, you take some of these relative elements and you know you you, you cast them with different things and it, it would just be a great like settling of a town Far like you know a a, a western frontier story, uh, but of but course it, it it has these great amazing things that you are finding, and it has it, it it's turning the corner now into this like oh this is like is this is this competent lost? Uh -huh. this it's a like, couple of different so, shows. It's well, a couple of different yeah. shows. Because like you're like because your take and nothing wrong. I don't disagree with anything you said, but my take was like. I'm like, at first, I'm like, I'll watch this, but man, like, just a few people on a planet is such an old trope, but it's lazy, cheap sci fi. I don't know how much I'm going to get into it. And then I'm like, oh, wait, that you know, the caveat at the beginning, they're robots, you know, and there's this other yeah. element. And then I'm, the wind, the space crusaders show up. <laughs> yeah. The space crusaders show up with a friggin' like the 15th century, you know, lo looking and approach sort of people, dudes show up. I'm like, well, this took a very interesting turn. Let's oh, see yeah. where this goes. And then it's like, you know, to be rooting for a genocidal murder bot is amazing. Uh, it's so it's good. so it's so gets yeah, it's like a great science fiction novel because you can't nail it down and say, Well, it's just this. Because it, it's, it's not. It's right. Yeah. It's not. And 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 we are getting the further we get into it, it's like it, it reminds me of those moments that I love the most about loss that, that now it's hard to even like point to because you realize they were hollow. They were literally just the fascinating looking shapes that had nothing within them. And with the amount of care 
that this show has already shown in building out their world and building out the, the, the conflicts that all these characters are, are aligned on their motivations are, are interesting and solid. Now, when you introduce a mystery character or something like that, or a mystery motivation or a, a something in, in the distance, I'm like, okay, I feel confident and ensconced that this is going to have a payoff. This is going to make yeah. the world bigger. And it's fast. You- like, like that's, you know, the thing I didn't like about Lost, having watched it a couple, a year or so ago now, is like Lost is slow and it's kind of formulaic where Raised by Wolves, I mean, the first episode, the, f- the first episode, the first couple episodes are like, those could have been arcs that you spent a whole show season on. Well, yeah. And, I mean, and oh, it yeah. just, it, it, bla- it, it blasts through different, Pla- for a for for good reason and in, in, in a good way, uh, but it, it's not skimp on on uh, making you wait too long on what it, what's well, going to happen next. There was a moment in season one of Lost, or or maybe it was season two, where Andrew and I, who were watching it together, were just like, "Oh my god, the smoke monster! Is it nanobots? Like you know, like uh, they could do this 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 whole cool like retro future." 1970s like what if they did discover telekinesis and and they and there there's this like you know semi pocket universe where all these things have gone ahead and then it's like it just sits there and eventually it just becomes god and it's like oh okay so none of this none of this interesting stuff you you even really wanted to pick up and run with this isn't really a science fiction show this is just a a veneer that you've painted over it which and 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 all that being said i could still defend lost in terms of like the characters but like that be that's not this show. This show is like no. All of these things matter. All of these tubes matter. All of this technology matters. Every single element of this world, this space arc, this this these eyes, these you know, like this is all something that you should be paying attention to because it is going to be relevant to the story going forward. And it's like, that's what it brought me back to is, is like that, those, those halcyon days where I'm like, Ooh, is the smoke monster nanobots. And then it was like, the, so, that show was like, yeah, who cares? Uh, is Sawyer yeah, going to kiss the girl? Here's my, my, here's my impression of lost. Okay. Gentlemen, I have a deck of cards in front of me. Ah. I want you to imagine for a moment that you're going to think of a card. The top of the box is going to open you will see a card slowly slide up, slide up with no control for me, slide up even four, then float three inches above the top of the box, slowly revolve into the air out in the air, but it will be blank. And then as we concentrate, it is going to turn into the card you are thinking of. Oh, wow. Are you ready? That's crazy. Yeah, yes. I'm ready for it. Wouldn't that, wouldn't that be cool? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't I paint a wonderful picture in your head? In my You're head, welcome. I was really that happy with it. That is the real magic. <laughs> the real magic is that it happened inside your heads, everybody. That is real storytelling, you see. War I'd actually make that happen, who cares at that point? <laughs> that I mean, was, that's what... Mystery Box in a nutshell, you mm-hmm. know, and that's why... Abrams doesn't use mystery box anymore. And you saw that when he did the final star Wars film, he realized well, the and problem with that theory. You know, there was, like, okay. uh, you know, JJ Abrams announced that there's a new series, you know, like subject to change or whatever. And mm-hmm. it's like, Oh, like a big mysterious premise. And I, I almost yelled at my computer screen. I was like, yeah. no, like, no, no. Like I, 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 no. I'm trying to discipline a dog. Like, no, you do not get yeah. down. Get down. <laughs> Let me tell you what Lost inspired, but what worked. Walking Dead. What if the world was zombies? Ah, oh, and then we're going to find it. No, no. You just got to survive in a world filled with zombies and how awful that's people it. are. That is your story. You know, that's the premise. There is no big, there are little answers like how it happened, but you don't care because it's not important because the reality is consistent and it's horrible. That's great storytelling. How many seasons, how many spinoffs is, is Walking Dead done? And I would have told you at the time, like, this is a zombie thing. How far can you go? Like two or three episodes? It's the same thing over and over again? No, Andrew, nope. you are wrong. People love it. Yeah. Yep. Just, yeah, every, we got to get some food. I don't know. Oh, zombies. Uh, we're almost going to die. And then every once in a while, somebody dies. And it's like, uh, rinse, repeat. People love it. It It, 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 it is uh, uh, McDonald's. Uh, 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 a billion people can't be wrong. 
uh, I, you know, I was in China and you know, people there, I was there talk, like, Oh, what's your favorite show? I'm like, Oh, they're like, do you watch walking dead? I'm like, mm-hmm. a little bit. I'm like, Oh, we love it. We love it. I'm like just universal. It's like, um, w- one last thing on raised by wolves. Uh, we, uh, we have a gap, I guess, between whatever the next show we want to talk about for spoiling time is. So we're going to be covering, uh, raised by wolves on, uh, it's spoiler in time. Oh, call me up. Uh, uh, yeah. I, I want to be. I want to be doing it. Uh, I doing, also want to point two out. A week. I also want to point out that my wife will not say the name of the show because she has the midwestern affectation that I consistently mock her for of saying "woofs" instead of "wolves." <gasps> Raised by wolves. So, you, <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's so I'll, I'll I'll constantly try to trick her into you know, saying what the name of it what is. What do you want to so watch far, tonight? I've, yeah, and she just goes <laughs> "ow." <laughs> it's a Shakira. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Angie, you got a pick? I have a pick. And man, like, I just, this thing popped up for once. Like, the Twitter sort of random stuff served a purpose. <laughs> and it is usually like you, you watch. You watch one car video, and next thing it's all about, like, you know, how to find the right laminate for your, you know, deck. And yeah. so it's important. It just, you got to get the right stuff. If you get galvanized in 2021, we're leaving galvanized in 2020. So there's a video called the bizarre world of fake martial arts on YouTube. And I sent you the link to that Bryce. Mm-hmm. Uh, it is um, first. I'm like, Oh, that's cool. Cause like so much of there is just like BS. And by the way, I'm claiming dibs on, a, there's a story in there about, I, th- I t- think I mentioned before the guy who did a uh, count Dante, who had these comic book ads for like yes. the death touch and all this. And we've talked about that guy, like the whole Chicago, like uh, dojo wars is something that we need to make a series about. But this goes, it starts off talking about like these people using like, oh, fake chi, just like defeating their opponent by touching them and whatever. And it's completely BS. It's fake martial arts. None of it's real. You can't do that. And, you know, the people who they always do these demonstrations with tend to be their own students who seem to know exactly how they're supposed to behave. Like this is where a guy will wave his hand at somebody and they'll just fall down. Or in this yeah. case, just stare at them. So this video goes in there and just sort of dismantles, talks about some of the origins of fake martial arts. And again, the guy's a big fan of martial arts, as am I, but then shows these BS ones. And then 20 minutes in, it takes, holy cow, a very interesting turn because they talk about how under, in China, there is sort of the, and the, the reawakening or whatever the, the current program they're trying to do right now is they wanted to have people get a deep appreciation for Chinese arts and Chinese culture, including Chinese martial arts. And they elevated and they would do like primetime specials showing showing Tai Chi experts and stuff. And there's a Chinese MMA enthusiast and fighter who's, you know, an older guy who's more of a hobbyist, but a radio personality, Zhu Jingdong, who was like, hey, um, those like... uh, these traditional arts, like you know, the Wu Chain, whatever, these like they're not good. They're not real. They're not Tai Chi is not a fighting technique. It's not good. These are not, these will not help you in a fight. And he's been like saying, like, kind of like saying these things aren't real. And then people are like, oh, how dare you? And he's like, okay. And he's talking about these, these like fake martial arts practitioners, or whatever, like, I will go against you. And he's like, I'm in my 40s and overweight. And so they've had like the the big, the big most famous Tai Chi experts and some of these other people who are these traditionalists have been getting into going into the ring with this guy to prove that he's wrong. And he's just an ignorant person doesn't understand how superior these systems are. And they promptly get their butts kicked. And he's been doing this over and over again, just trying to say like, listen, there's real martial arts. There's fake. These things are fake. But because this is China and because of the emphasis on, no, these things are real. These things are great. uh, Your MMA things is this bastardized Western sort of concoction. He's had a social credit score demolished. He can't fly. If he goes to do tournaments, they make him wear clown makeup. And they're doing everything in the world they can to try to silence or humiliate him because unpopular opinion and goes against what the government's trying to say. And this guy suffered a tremendous price for what he's been going through. Really, really, really recommend watching this. And, you know, it's not just the government, but like people, you know, like, well, He's clearly a, a not a good person, so we need to sort of you know diminish him. And they did like a primetime special where he went off, you know, one of the biggest masters they had and just demolished the guy. And then you watch them demolish the guy, keep beating him up, and then they go, they declare it a tie. <laughs> <laughs> 
but they make him wear wow. like he had to wear like watermelon makeup on his face and call himself like the watermelon guy in order to be able to fight. He finally got kicked out of his his own school because the pressure and he'd been teaching there for years. And there's a video of him in tears. And this is he's just trying to say, like, hey, like, you know, these things, some of these things aren't real. Some of these things are made up yeah. and they're not helpful. And if you think they're if you're trying to say they're real fighting art, they're not. And he is a very, very brave person. Uh, again, his name is Zhu Zhengdong. Um, check out the bizarre world of fake martial arts, and it is heart wrenching to see how far this guy is willing to go. You know, to sort of say, like, you know, we we need to be able to say what's real and what's not. Yeah, wow. Uh, and this is this is a full you know thirty minute documentary on YouTube. We'll have it in the show notes here um, from yeah. uh, Super Eye Patch. Wolf. Wow. wow, this is incredible. Yeah, and and just a. Uh, uh... You know, released earlier this week. Oh, oh, Super Eye Patch Wolf. I've actually seen a few things of of his. He does uh, some wrestling stuff too. Yeah, this is a year old. This is from oh, oh 2020. Year old. Okay, yeah, oh, 2020. Okay, yeah. Uh, very cool. Yeah. Again, it, it's it's not it's not a dismiss. It's not dismissive martial arts because this comes from a place of you know he's a fan of it and whatever. But you have to be able to say this is written, the the danger. And, 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 and what, what a what a crazy thing of just like, hey, this is bad. Like like the, 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 he's not even you know uh, uh, stating anything that isn't just fodder on martial arts forums for as long as there's been usenet right like like just his his opinion that these things are are bad and not really good in a fight that's insane insane and and he has to suffer those hardships yeah like you know tai chi tai chi is a wonderful form of exercise it is a wonderful form of getting people to be mobile particularly for elderly people it has a tremendous amount of value and i don't you know any of the people i know they're critical as a fighting art aren't diminishing that a lot of them are champions like no tai chi is great but the moment you try to teach people something like tai chi for self-defense you're irresponsible yeah. you're, you're teaching something that will not work and you know and we we would get that when I was in judo, I did that for years and we would get, we were a competitive school, meaning that like we were every month we were doing competitions and stuff. So we had to practice for a judo competition, which there's no striking, but it's full contact, everything else. We'd get students from other schools, like these Taekwondo factories where, you know, you, you just do your time and pay your money and you get a black belt and people are like, Oh, I'm a black belt. I'm like, well, is it Taekwondo? We'd be a bit of a snob and hmm. they would get demolished because they never had any real, training they were taught how to kick boards and kick high and done this sort of stuff now you could take a student from there and very quickly teach them how to fight but the way they were taught were taught in this school was giving these people this sort of this false confidence you know when you look yeah. at your top mma fighters you don't hear taekwondo listed first you know no um yeah so man it's, it's there's schools of karate the same way and a lot of martial arts could be it depends on the dojo whatever but my point is uh man this guy's a hero from all I've seen there and to, to imagine how to be able to speak out about that and to keep doing that, even though you're, you know, like they would make him, they got rid of his, his social credit. He can't fly. So if he goes to fly and do a competition, you know, he's on the train for, he's on a bus or whatever for 10 hours. Wow. God, you know, it's just, yeah, that's terrible. Bizarre role to fake martial arts. Gentlemen, it's been weird. Hmm. There we go. Hey, good episode, everybody. Cool beans. All right. All the Taekwondo people are going to want to beat me up. <laughs> well, and they won't uh -oh. be able to. I'll be safe. You'll be good. I'll be <laughs> safe. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Stay, down, Stay down, Taekwondo. Stay down. There are great Taekwondo schools, and there are great students there, too. All right. So we're going to take a minute here and get ready for After Things. Um, if you guys need to take a break, now is a good time to do that. Yes, we are back. Cool beans. Uh, hello, everybody. Up here. Um, coming up uh, here on uh, twitch.tv slash night attack tomorrow, uh, we've got night attack. Tonight, we've got cord killers. I believe we've got Ayaz on again. That'd be great. Um, let's see. Oh, nice. Uh, Thursday, Thursday evening. Marbles week three commences. So tune in yeah. For so yeah. Did you have to, uh, you have to take a week off? We, we ended up pushing it. I ended up doing it last night instead of on Thursday. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, so everybody tune in for that. We'll have Friday Night Bryce on Friday. We're playing through Hitman. I think we're uh, we're we're gonna do the Hitman Two DLC. They have a couple of DLC maps, and then I think we'll start Hitman Three. So cool. that'd be nice. pretty cool. Um, yeah, and then yeah, Justin R Young here on Twitch doing the politics stuff all the time. Um, everybody make sure you check him out. Yeah, we um, you know we. I think I'm gonna have to modify my schedule again because even though I just modified it, because it's sort of weird that I I'm now like Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. That seems like an odd schedule. It's um, a little it's a little one sided. I I can see well, that if it's a little, little one sided. Little one sided. One sided. Um, a Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. Get some of the midweek and then get get a get a weekend day. Well, yeah, you know the problem is I don't know. I mean, I, I think that there's there's a lot. Like I don't even know whether or not I want to screw with it now because I don't want to reset the schedule and make a big deal about it and then have to miss a bunch of stuff while we're like moving because that's going to be on the horizon in the next month or so. So like, wow, uh, that's I might oh just my God, next month. Oh, homie, I this mean, is homie, fast. homie, homie. Uh, ooh. Clo I mean, appraisal should be done today. Wow. Um, and then... Was there any damage to that home in the storm? Did they... We have been told that it never lost power and okay. that everything has been fine. Um, mm -hmm. You know, obviously, there's still a game, a telephone that we're kind of playing between our, our agent to the seller who is not living there but has family that is our tenants there basically um so we're still playing i think more of a game of telephone than i think in in a perfect world i would be comfortable with yeah. i would i would love to just be getting pictures and videos from inside there immediately but you know you got to go through the process um but yeah, if everything goes according to plan, uh, it'll be soon. Uh, we close wow. in the beginning of March, and then we are technically landlords until uh, the beginning of April. But they might be even out sooner than that. At which point, wow. you know, we're, like uh, uh, we got to figure out how we're moving the majority of our stuff. But I'm just gonna load up our our RAV4 and drive that some bitch down to, 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 to Texas for good. I'll tell you what, I had a, I had a good experience using, um, the U-Haul. U-Haul has like a pods service. I've had a very good use. Good with that. Yeah. Andrew says he's had it twice. What I like about those is no, I own two of them. Oh, he I, owns two of them. Oh, I, wow. pods. Uh, what I liked about those is that they are smaller than the like name brand pods one, which is like the size yeah. of a shipping container. So like for me, you know, one kind of one bedroom uh, situation, uh, you know, it was probably a couple grand, I think, to 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 fill it and send it down there and they'll hook you up with movers and stuff. And um, I'm sure you guys, the two of you probably got uh, some more stuff. But I think I think in terms of that, the, sh the shipping lifestyle uh, uh, has probably 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 come a long way since you moved out to out to Oakland. Well, I mean, yeah. I, I didn't bring anything out out here i didn't uh I, oh, right. I you just had your car place. shipped on a train right i literally I, I had, had to yeah i packed my shit into the car and then that was it i didn't bring anything out to la and yet now i have <laughs> you know i have you know they had everything in my florida house that i eventually got wheeled down and then put into two pods that are now sitting in some warehouse in miami and then I have a storage unit here, and my ability to accumulate stuff for somebody who claims not to want stuff sucks. <laughs> Bad. Um. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, we're gonna figure it out. I, I, we're, we're investigating a bunch of options. The only thing that is is kind of guiding my my decision making on that is uh, no one that I've ever spoken to has ever said, uh, "Man, we really regret." spending money on those movers <laughs> or like that was too expensive. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. uh, usually people are, um, are, are very excited that they didn't have to do a ton of moving, but we're slowly packing stuff up. Um, and, uh, we'll be, 
yeah, shipping out sooner than it is comfortable thinking of, especially since we're not officially done with everything yet. Um, you know, we're waiting on the uh, on on the final pieces of the puzzle to to get put together. Nice. Uh, did you need a break, Justin? Did you need a- no, let's roll. Okay. Then uh, Fine. rub your professionalism in. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, give me one second. Just like I wear an adult diaper, I'm a pro. Yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, I see what the problem is. One last second here. All righty. Cool. Well, let's start after things then. Here in three, two. Hello and welcome to After Things. I'm Adrian Main, joined by Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hello. And Mr. Justin Robert Young. Hello. All right, guys, you were begging me to do this before, mm-hmm. so I will give you an update on my new book, which just launched this week. Yes, which... please. Hey! And thank you for the recommendations, by the way, on Weird Things. That was great. That meant a lot. Oh, oh. oh my God. Uh, so, uh, so I don't need them. I don't need them. You know why I don't need them? Because I had a great launch. Because you're number you one bestseller. Number one. So uh, Black Coral, which is a sequel to my book, The Girl Beneath the Sea. Um, two things. Most important of all, they did the matte cover finish on this, but I think the printing is they perfected it now. I used to hate the matte finish because it was too powdery, but this is nice and smooth, and you actually want to rub it against your face, Ooh. which I don't recommend with the ebook. Black Coral is a sequel, and... My publisher is Thomas and Mercer, which is actually owned by Amazon. It's part of Amazon Publishing. This isn't the same as KDP, whatever. This is their whole real publishing house, and I've been doing several books through them, and it has been a wonderful, wonderful experience. They have been some authors who are more used to sort of a traditional world, have different, you know, expectations and stuff. For me, it's been great because most of my friends are ebook readers and they're really heavy into ebook, although they do print versions. The and part of releasing a book with them is, and part of doing a book is, you know, I finish a book and they have, they assign an editor to work with me to go through some of the notes. I have an editor at Amazon and they hire, they'll hire an outside editor, freelancer. In this case, a guy named Ed Stackler, who's amazing. My editor at Amazon is Liz Pearson, who's wonderful, but Ed will go in and give me kind of like developmental notes and stuff on this. And Liz will give me that. And I go through and I work through a couple iterations with Ed. And then we have the finished, you know, semi-final product. And then it goes through copy of readers and then fact checkers. And there's a whole layer of the stuff there, but they keep you involved all throughout. You know, like I got like, Hey, what do you, they send me a questionnaire. What do you think about for the cover? What should the cover be like? Um, what do you think about, uh, you know, what are your suggestions? And they send me cover samples and stuff and I make notes about stuff and what I like. And so I have input on every single thing. They're yeah. going to, you know, have their, as publishers, they get to sort of handle kind of everything outside the text in the book. But well, and we've talked about this show book. in years before how you were handling a lot of that your stuff yourself, right? In terms of like cover art, right? Like you were handling for for some of those those books years ago. You would you the, would do a lot the stuff of stuff I did, yeah. yeah. So I have yeah I have a pretty good like you know I I have my own instincts on stuff and what I like, and they've done some really good stuff. And you know that cover they did for the Naturalist was amazing, and you know hard to top that. But I think they've done done a really good job with like each series has its own look and feel to it. You mm-hmm. know between like these two books here, yeah. So they also have a, a publicist they hire that I work with, who in the case was Megan Beatty, who's doing that working internally with Amazon's publishing. Uh, it did a great job of getting me a lot of interviews and stuff on podcasts and other places. I don't know how much those move books to be honest. I don't know that they don't, I don't know that they do, but I know that what helped was with the first book girl beneath the sea that got selected as part of one of the Amazon prime reads of selections of the month, which was like one of seven or eight books that people, anybody who was an Amazon prime member could download for free where you get a small amount of money for doing that. But what you get is you get a huge amount of people reading your book and reviewing it. And so that gave the girl beneath the sea, a huge launch girl beneath the sea came out in May and it moved a hundred thousand copies, wow. you know, outside of that sold a hundred thousand, which was insane. Mm-hmm. And this book has, uh, the pre-sales for this were huge. And then this book had a great launch. And then as you saw, we're already up at 400 reviews. We're already, it's like right now it's number 50 on Amazon. It got up to like, you know, 30 or number 30 or something like that. So it's been a great launch all around. Yeah, That's insane. That's, that's great. And that, and that's so huge, especially when the first book has that, that 
a obviously you have a larger install base for the sequel but also uh people are able to pre-order these books as soon as they're done reading it especially on the ebook side right yeah absolutely so it's you know, we talk about you have to think about things is not of one offs, but everything is a series, everything's sequential. So uh, if you go click on susp- that, notice it's number two in suspense action fiction. Bryce, go ahead and click on that to see what's number one. Sure. I'm going to click on gotta see who my competition action is. fiction. Yeah. Uh, number one is who's... The Girl Beneath the Sea. Now that's from Andrew. Ma- that's from Andrew Maine. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. I have the one and two spots now. Oh, wow, uh, look at that. That's synergy. And that's like, whether you're doing yeah. a podcast or something, you build up a body of work and you improve it over time. And where I started from my self-published books to these, I'd like to think my quality and consistency has gotten better with time. And now, you know, I, I'm still liable to make mistakes and stumble, but I try to learn from everything beforehand. But then if something like if somebody likes something, then you go look into the next thing. And then you go look at the next thing that person's done. And that's what I've been trying to do is just build up an audience of people that see my name and say, okay, I'll buy this book and, you know, keep, you know, keep pursuing that. So that's been great. Side note, the one thing I did differently Mm -hmm. was I was frustrated with MailChimp. I've talked about this before because I realized that like, I don't, I only advertise when I really have a book out. I don't really use it that much else. And MailChimp, it's comp, you know, to try to keep your books on there or keep your book, keep your subscribers on there. They double charge you if you you put them into multiple categories and stuff. They do a lot of stuff. I think it's kind of sketchy, to be honest with you. And I finally just said, I'm done. And I took my entire mailing list off of MailChimp. I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I just took it down because I was paying like 150 bucks a month. I'm like, I'm not getting much for that. So I'm like, what do I do? And then a week, two weeks prior, I'm like, well, I guess. I'll upload it to Substack. I didn't even know how Substack worked. I mean, I knew people could subscribe, but I didn't realize I could put my book on sub. I could upload my subscribers to Substack. Yeah. So I uploaded my subscribers to Substack. And so I imported all of them from there, which allowed you to do. I'm like, cool. And then I changed on my website, my sign up to the Substack sign up. And then come launch day, I'm like, can I just send out a post, like announce that I have a launch to all these people that normally I had to pay a lot of money to, you know, MailChimp to do? Why, yes, you can, Andrew. And boom. Everybody from before, as far as I know, got notified about the new book. And then I also got feedback by people harding it, whatever. And yeah. you know, the open rate was great. It was like 20% or something, which is That's great, great considering. Uh, so Substack yeah. was a big win. I, I had that same um, experience a couple of weeks back. I don't know if I mentioned this, but I am I transitioned that Video Games with Bryce newsletter over to Substack. Um, yeah. And it was it was very easy to bring in the subscribers. Um, it was, they have a way to bring in some of your previous posts from MailChimp, but that is, um, not perfect. A lot of formatting stuff just doesn't, uh, stick around, but, uh, but I was surprised it brought in anything and, and it seems like, yeah, you know, a lot of that is just because MailChimp is so weird with their formatting. I mean, again, it's, it's, I don't want to make this a dump on MailChimp segment, but well, let's like, do it. Uh, 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 let's do it. They're we'll not. It. They're not. They're not built. They're not built for what we want to do. We right. want to have an easy way to interact with an email audience, and what they want to do is have a uh, uh, be a recurring uh, uh, expense for e-commerce, yeah. right? a comprehensive That's, tool for e-commerce. Yeah, which is not what you and, need for and newsletter. I, and I, I, I would, I would, I would, I would even. <laughs> I don't even know how much it is that, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I, I think that certainly all their tools are built with that in mind. I don't know if they get there, but then again, I don't run an e-commerce thing. And also, you know, I think once you are dealing with that kind of money um, and, and that relationship, any kind of change in that relationship is something that you are hesitant to make. And I can, I can understand that. So uh, yeah, uh, I, I think that that is, that's where they want to go. Substack, by the way, I still think is kind of an imperfect fit for for what I want to do because by and large, they want me to do exclusive content. They make money on exclusive content or they make when money When you do a paid my, subscription. Yes. Or or do that, having that be the thing to drive, you know, your interaction with the audience. And uh, right as of now, I don't. I, I send five emails a week that are free. Um, and each time I do it, I have to go through a process that default is sending it exclusive, right? Uh, uh, whenever people sign up, they are given 
a a option to pay, right? It, it's not immediately uh, obvious, you know, that that there is a comprehensive free option or that uh, uh, the free option is is the default. So hmm. I. I think that that Substack is something that right now is the greatest tool that I have used in terms of creating emails and sending it. Uh, I, I applaud them for not having hard barriers like Mailchimp does in terms of uh, punishing me for monthly for having an, an audience of a certain level if I'm not immediately monetizing it. I've certainly made you know the the difference between spending a hundred dollars a month on Mailchimp and making uh, the couple hundred dollars that I've made on Substack is is obviously tremendous, right? That's that that's great. Um, but yeah, I, I I'm I'm very happy with where I'm at. I think I think Substack, like yeah, I don't I use it just because I wanted a free email service and I wanted to do this. And the problem is that like there are kind of two kinds of emails. There's the ones you want to get, and there's the ones like okay, you'll tolerate. And marketing emails tend to be more I'll tolerate mine, but there are people who will sell me stuff, but they're infrequent about it. And I like to get it like, oh, somebody's got something cool and it's it's informative. Yeah. Uh, and I think that MailChimp doesn't cater to that at all. And you know, they treat everything like, well, does that avoid getting spam? Don't want to spam, don't want to spam. I'm like, no, I just want to reach the people that want to hear from me. I don't want to, yeah, I don't want somebody who doesn't want me to, you know, hear from me. I don't, I'm not trying to be too noisy. But I think that with the subscription thing, that is exciting because. I could see authors starting, and maybe it's probably, I'm going to say could see, it's probably being done, authors creating exclusive stories and serializations and stuff and using that as a platform to do it for any kind of print content and you start expanding what that means, I think it could be a great, great, like if I wasn't pursuing a lot of what I'm doing, like I could see all the stuff I'm doing in AI and stuff and interesting you know things there. Like I could see, I could, I could publish a thing of techniques. If I were a magician, I could do a virtual magic, you know, yeah, magazine of teaching people magic and stuff through there. There's, it's such a great platform. It's so simple, which I love. It's, it's great. I mean, I am all in on 2021 being the, 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 the paywalls I want to cross are for emails. Like I, I subscribe to, uh, two of them, one, a political one, one, a, uh, uh, well, I guess they're both political, but, uh, I, I, I'm, very happy. The money I I spend, I feel great about. The content I get, I love. Uh, uh, it is direct to me. It is without a filter. I'm not worried about missing it. Uh, uh, thus far, we have yet to have some of the problems that uh, you know uh, Patreon has kind of gotten into. It seems like Substack is primarily focused on being uh, a little bit more of a a a, a boring platform and not an identity that the, the only hill that they seem to want to die on is uh that that the old rules of journalism are are dying for which i'm i have been on on that train since you know the turn of the century um so uh, i i i am i am all in i love what they're doing i love the the, the, the careers that they are emboldening I am I'm spending more time in email. If anything, like at this point, I feel like I'm ready for another iteration of email that prioritizes uh these subscriptions that I have so I can I can enjoy them in in a way that I've that I used to with an RSS feed mm -hmm. because that's what it has kind of uh, uh become for me. Well, you know, I was just thinking like the the kind of the trick of Substack is that it is a blog disguised as a newsletter uh right like every all your sub stacks when you yes. when you make them right not the only the energy the energy of what is happening right now is email reminds me so much of when blogging was exciting well and and you know that's how it's presented outside of your inbox is yeah you know as posts right you can even go in and edit posts and you know i i clicked on the stats page and the top graph there's not a lot of statistics that you get which i think is kind of a downside for Substack. is uh how many hits are you getting like how many hits yeah. are you are you seeing and and you know whether that's coming to your inbox or or to the website you know that is that is more of a blog thing i mean they, they'll tell you your open rate too which is a you know a, an email specific thing um i i wonder if if a next thing for Substack is you know for the user a Substack 
umbrella and here are all of your posts from all of your sub stacks that you're following and subscribed to. I could I could Maybe. see something like that where it's like uh, taking uh, kind of like you mentioned like uh, taking on RSS. Here is the new RSS and it's through Substack. I can I could see that. I I think that would be maybe not great if it didn't also incorporate a real RSS, you know, catcher in it, but um I I think that could be a nice I mean, step. I I think I think that right now they're they're just in a great position. The 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 the, the people that have found it are the right kind of people in terms of creating the right kind of content. The energy in the writing is palpable. It is, it is like, uh, again, there was this moment in blogging in the early aughts that everybody was taking chances. Uh, uh, people were kind of writing very much to their passion. And there was this concept that we will sack the kingdom and uh, 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 we will be the new rulers. And it's like, like, like many revolutions, the end result, <laughs> even if they're successful, is far different than the idealized versions of, the, of those initial rallies. Uh, and and what we have now is this bizarre wasteland of like, you know, the, the legacy and remnants of old media uh, mixed with the the worst elements of what happened from the blogging revolution. And it's like now the idea that without gatekeepers, I know every uh, uh, every time I'm that this person who I care about has something to say, it's going to find me. Mm -hmm. It's going to find me. So, like it, it, yeah. A couple of people have said it did not find them. So I would say anybody who says that you didn't get just one of my sub stack, do us a favor, take a look and see if it ended up in your spam. Yeah. In the spam you. folder. Yeah. Or promotions I mean, obviously in Gmail you, that, that, that's the other the other big thing is especially if you use gmail that uh some of them find their way into promotions uh especially with ones that with emails that i that come as fast or as as frequent as like mine do which are five days a week uh it can be tricky because some people i mean and i got a pretty high open rate like i got mm -hmm. a, a a 50 plus open rate Ooh. on I was my, I was about uh, to brag about mine because I I get about uh, like my last one had about forty one percent. Look at that. Yeah, like uh, uh, I'm I'm happy with it, but uh, some of them, uh, uh, yeah. But and again, that's that's an email sorting problem. Like like and and you don't have you, that you problem if there's Gmail... a if there's a Substack reader, right? Well, or no, I just want I, Gmail. Gmail right now has like a. Uh, uh, promotions which is like their version of like you know spam plus like inbox and whatever social mm -hmm. and it's like if, if if you could redo that and just give me newsletters give me a newsletter thing mm. or or don't just green light all the Substack stuff just don't I, I don't ever want i like there's not going to be anything that comes from Substack that i don't want to read that i haven't intentionally done like if i could just whitelist all that, or I could make it easy for the, for, for for listeners or readers to to whitelist that kind of stuff. Boy, howdy, would I love it! I uh, yeah. if you're a listener, I I don't know. I'm assuming you can still do this, but I know when I was still using Gmail as my mail, uh, my daily mail client, I had turned all of those things off. I hated the exact thing that we're describing: having important things go up in promotions and then I never see them, or social things end up in a weird like I I I. I have ha had had that stuff off for a really long time, but it is still a it's still a pit that a lot of stuff falls into because it's kind of a default thing, um, and that's you know we we talked about hey that the hey email before and what I yeah really enjoy about that is that I can say okay hey you know uh, Andrew uh, Andrew Substack stuff okay those are gonna go into my feed where all of the you know promotional things end up and they end up in kind of a big viewable list of things or you know you 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 decide where that stuff goes you're not hoping that gmail figures i mean it look out. i think we, we've been trying to solve email for as long as we've had email right and and uh ultimately where i feel like 2021's energy is leading us toward is uh email is is like the most viable uh important uh uh the thing that we have on the internet in a world where all of these other communities that we've started have kind of uh, uh, twisted into things that we are either comfortable or not comfortable with. There's 
old email, like just, I, just sitting there. And I, that's I, the reasons I just like reiterate this. Like I love Substack. It's very like, and there are a lot of features I could add, but like, I love that it's simple. It does a thing. Hey, send free email. Great. Or pay a monthly fee and get these messages. It, that's just, it's simple. And that's, that's a huge platform. The potential for that is enormous. And it's, yeah, it's why media is scared. Uh, we got a couple of questions that came in there. Somebody had asked me how many hours of research do I do for my books? Mm. And it's a very good question because there's two ways to look at it. Uh, I will tell you a secret. And that is, if you want to write a book, just think of all the interesting things you know, draw circles around them and try to fit them into a book. When you read the book and you follow the course of the story, you're like, oh, wow, how do they know this and this, this? Well, it's stuff I already knew. I didn't research it. I just took things I knew. I don't write books. I don't write, uh, although one of my books, a couple of them have been considered medical thrillers. I don't really write medical thrillers because I'm not qualified or smart enough to write that. I don't write historical books because I don't know enough about any particular period in history to write competent about that. I love uh I love science, I love biology, I love artificial intelligence, I love those things. I'm a scuba diver, I go diving. I can write books about that. So, you know, that's what I do is I sort of just take the stuff I already know and write around it. Yeah. I mean, that's that's for for for, you know, any project whether it's writing or or whatnot, you you, ha you have to play to your strengths, right? Um, you know, the things that you are most knowledgeable about, most passionate about, those are at least a good, a good starting point in terms of, uh, where to draw inspiration, right? People can tell when something is not just like smart or accurate, but when you are impassioned about something, when it's, uh, when it's, when it's, when you're inspired, um, I think that's such a big part of any creative work. And, and a lot of that comes out in your writing, Andrew. And it's crazy where it will take you, though. So, like, when I started writing The Naturalist, I was just beginning to take artificial intelligence and machine learning seriously and just starting to learn it, which is just a few years ago that first book came out. And by the time I was writing the fifth book in the series, uh, I had to take a break because I was working with OpenAI on helping them, you know, uh, develop some of the methods for using gpt3 and you know doing that and it's just kind of because i just learned enough and got to the point where all of a sudden as a person who's got an interest in words and artificial intelligence had a way to contribute to this very exciting thing and that started because i started writing about it in a book and i got interested in it and then that's all sort of my my brain became more attuned to looking for things about that and the next thing you know that happens there i wrote girl beneath the sea and i was thinking a lot about sharks and underwater stuff and all of this and then next thing you know i'm on the discovery channel surrounded by great white sharks mm -hmm. so these things you can you follow your path but then as you start writing more about it you'll become more knowledgeable so be careful what you get into <laughs> uh so my advice is we talk about this again but like start that email list early started early my my lessons i've learned from my books too is it's not enough to say you know oh i spent 10 years doing this it's like like i often meet people like i've been doing this for 10 years i'm like yeah but if you're doing it the wrong way it doesn't make a difference it, it doesn't and we confuse time spent versus lessons learned and sometimes there's a correlation sometimes there's not sometimes somebody can go in and pick something up very very quickly because they know how to learn. And I'll give you an example. So I've been working on a little side project, a little software thing. I'm always working on something. And I have a server where I've got to get, I'm using not a server, but I'm using cloud functions, which is basically a way to have certain functions run in the cloud. But every time I got to upload them, it takes me three or four minutes to get them uploaded. So I have it, I'm like, I need to test this. And there's a way to test it locally, but I was doing something funky where I had to run on a server. So I have to test it, click send, and now I've got to wait four minutes before I can see if it worked. And that means that if I've got to make 50 to 60, 50 to 60 changes, at least you add up that amount of time. And that is how much time that is lost because it takes so long to get a feedback. So, you know, if, had I been running it all locally, it would have taken me two or three hours, but because I'm having to wait four minutes every time I need to change, look for a change or something, it takes me two days wow. and life can yeah. be like that. We, if you, one, if you're not even learning the lessons, you'll never learn. If the lessons come too slowly, 
then it takes forever to learn. It's why they tell startups, get your product out there fast. It's not to be first to market. It's first to learn. It's to get out there and yeah. experience. So you want to have those feedback cycles. I was, you know, my first year writing, I wrote, you know, I've talked to this before. I wrote 10 books. Why did I write 10 books? Because like I wanted to get to where I felt really comfortable as a writer. And most writers might write a book a year. I'm like, well, I'm going to do this in 12 months. So by the end of that year, not to say, oh, I'm as good as somebody been writing for 10 years. No, but I was a hell of a lot further along than an author that had been only writing for months. I think, I think something that uh, uh, really stuck with me was, uh, uh, yeah, I think it was Robert Rodriguez who said that every filmmaker has like eight or 12 crappy movies in them. And, <laughs> and the faster you get them out, the better. Like, just go. Just go, make stuff. Uh, uh, and, and while Robert Rodriguez, I think, is an ideal person to listen to when you're getting started, maybe not the best at how to evolve <laughs> past that. But like, uh, I think that that's true. Like, go, go, go. I mean, like the, uh, the biggest thing with the podcast stuff that I've, that I've worked on the, the scripted stuff, the, the thing that I realized was it's gotta be closer to the final form faster. Like it's mm -hmm. gotta be a, sh a, 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 a poopy podcast. <laughs> um, and that, Finding the crap podcast and circling what sucks, what sucks, what sucks, what's good, like is so much more effective than rewriting a script 50 times and finding yeah. like, like it, like it just get to that form, get to that thing. And then God, does your brain just, it, it will, it will find the the value. You'll be attracted to the value. You will, you will be naturally repelling against the weaknesses and like, that's that to me has become the killer instinct that is is progress that is progress that's the process of quality so two things one is uh the idea of fail early fail fast and fail cheaply right because yeah. that is critical is that is that when we made, Justin helped me make my first like film. I wanted to make a film and I remember reading Rob Rodriguez and he t made a point about like, you know, why people spend more money than they should. And I noticed a thing on every amateur filmmaking book. If you try to figure out what it cost to make a movie back in the late nineties, early two thousands, the number, the magic number was 30,000. $30,000 was what like low end indie feature film budgets were. And I was like, well, that's weird. Like why? Cause I couldn't find a correlation because even in the, even, you know, you could figure out if you're shooting on 16 millimeter and you're being strict about it, it maybe cost you $7,000 to do that. I'm like, why is that? Well, if you find out, like, if you look at the median age of like an indie filmmaker at that point was 26, 27 years old, that was the total amount that they could borrow on credit. That was their credit card limit. Mm, and so what yeah. they did is they spent up to their credit card limit on their first film. And I thought that's a huge mistake because the chances are your first film is going to suck, but will be a huge learning experience. And if you win 30, if you finish your film and you hate it and you're $30,000 in debt, you are not excited about being a filmmaker. No. You, 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 you are one of going to give up. But if you finish your first film and you're debt free, you're excited about doing your next film because you're like, oh my God, I learned so much. And I see this mistake made a lot. People launch businesses and launch stuff that like, no, you're going to learn a lot from this. But statistically speaking, you're going to be broke at the end of it doing this way and you're never going to want to do it again. Figure out a way to get all that learning and not go broke, not go do that. That is super, super, super critical. Like, no, but I really believe in myself. Well, you're delusional. You are a crazy person. And, um, and, there, and, and it's, you know, it, just to make it abundantly clear, you have to call it quits. When, sometimes you're going to have to call it quits before you're done. Sometimes if you see that it's not working and it's getting expensive, it's ballooning, you can't yeah. like... It, the sunk cost fallacy is real and people get into uh, really precarious situations because they keep putting good money after bad. And, and yeah. you know, you have to be open to like, okay, you know what? We tried it. It's not going to work out. Let's go on to the next thing so that you don't, you know, ruin your life trying to make <laughs> dog vests work. Dog vests are not going to work, Mark. <laughs> I had... I, you know, when after I did my first film, then I was going to go do a second one. I had this idea for an action movie, and we had a really crazy, violent plot line. And then 9 11 happened. And so then we changed that. And I rented an apartment, I rented a house to shoot at. I had an actor lined up, whatever. 
And two days in, the actor wasn't memorizing his lines. I wasn't fully into it. And I already spent a couple thousand dollars. And I'm like, this is not going to get better. It's not going to get better. This is, and I canceled canceled it and I had people upset with me. I'm like, I could, I could keep this going, you know, for several more weeks and shoot something that we're not going to be happy with. And it's all on me. It's not on the actor. It was all on me, you know, for just the way things turned out. But I'm like, I better stop this now. And that was hard because I already spent money, you know, mm-hmm. I'd spent money running a house and doing this stuff. But I was just like, no, I'm rushing this too fast. The script's not where it needs to be. There's not enough prep time. I was excited about what happened to the last project. I learned so much, but I've got to say, no, kill this now before you know that but you have to unless there's a financial cost though and you are learning i'm like you do got to learn to stick with it because like success is like success is waiting for everybody else to give up in many cases yes and and, yeah. and you know that's like you know my girlfriend is at film school it's like everybody else wants to be a director i'm like see what they want to be a year from now see what's going to happen yeah. two years from now see how many stay by it. the other thing to think about and a way to sort of is Sometimes you have to understand why you do a thing. You say, I want to do this because I want to feel good about myself. That is the wrong reason. If you say, I want to do this because I want to make a thing that then makes me feel good about myself, that's a good reason. You have to have that thing first to say, I want to make a thing that's good so then I feel good. If it's just like, I want to do a podcast so people tell me they love me and they like me, they're probably not going to. If you're like, I want to go do a podcast that's really good and people like me because of that, better. And I, and I would say the final form of that is find a process that makes you happy mm-hmm. or, or like if you can find the process that makes you happy, that's, that's where the real work is. Like that's where, you know, there's, there's a thing that I'm working on now that like, and I've, it's, it, it, it's a process that I've, I've had a couple of times where I have, have a first draft of something and I'm I'm at the point where I'm making it and I'm like, this blows. This is terrible. <laughs> and it's and it's only that much worse because the thing I did before was good. This finished product that I have is good and I know it's good. It's it's awesome. Uh and then yeah, you know, it does suck. And you listen to it and it's garbage. And then you're like, oh if we focused on that and we cut that and we reorganized it here and then it's like, well, it's better than trash. It's definitely going to be a crappier version of this thing I had before. And then it got better and it got better and it got better and it got better. And the process got easier and more fun and more rewarding. The more I went, you know, to understand that there's this bottoming out period at the beginning, at least for me. And then it got, better and better and better and better and better and better and better. And if I can keep myself in good spirits and if I can focus on what, you know, the, the core of the project is what makes the project good, then it will, that that's a process that I can repeat at, it, to the point where now, you know, I, you know, we, we're restarting everything again and it's like, Oh, this sucks. But now I'm not looking at it as like, Oh, that's a judgment on me. It's like, aha, we're at the sucky part now. <laughs> Look at that. Oh, it's, it sucks. Like, this is great. Like, let's, let's, you know, let's dive in. Yeah. When you, you have the tools. So there is a parallel sort of thing where Justin started out podcasting and myself with writing books. And we both were helpful to each other to a point. And I would say I was helpful to Justin a little bit early on. And then he had his own steam, but early on it was like, We'd record a thing and then we'd tear it apart. And and I don't think I yeah. ever told him anything he didn't already know. I just sort of amplified it and said, you know, yeah, that little voice you're ignoring, it's right. You know, and that's sometimes what needs to happen. But you know, we listened to our model was Buzz Out Loud with Tom Merritt, mm-hmm. Molly Wood, and Veronica Belmont. And before we even knew them, we were like, oh, you know, these guys do a great product. Let's listen to this. And so we'd record a thing. And then we'd redo the same thing over and over again. And it was annoying as all hell, but I knew from magic and other stuff, like where you, you, the early phase is not, not you is to say, this is what needs attention. This thing, you know, there's a lot of things need attention, but if you put attention on these things, everything else will slowly get better. And then Justin very quickly, you know, on his own steam did that with my books. Justin gave me great feedback. Very, very helpful. And I don't send in my books now because it's a lot to ask and they're big, huge books and stuff, but I have Justin's voice in my head now. So when I write a book and I go to the review and replan it, I'm like, ah, there's a little Justin here. What about those? What about those? What about this? And so eventually 
do you think your process gets simpler? Like Justin said, like I got a book due very, very soon. Like technically like within a week. Hmm. I haven't even written an outline or even know what the plot is. <laughs> wow. Uh, this is all, so, by the way, this is all a joke. Uh, just publishers yeah, and editors please, here listening. Yeah. This is Both all a joke. Thomas and Mercer, please. <laughs> uh, tune out. Oh, no, not that book. This is some other book. This, that, oh, that book. the yeah, other book, yeah, yeah, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now, I know, and I'm not, I don't believe in like, I thought, oh, I always wait to last minute and do my best work. Like, no, the best work you've ever done has been last minute, but that is not your best work. Your best yeah. work is um, having a methodical, good approach towards it. Your best work is when you're focused, and the only time some people are focused is last minute. For me, I know the process, and I know that like I have to focus on one thing at a time. I'm very sequential, but when I focus on one thing, I am a hundred percent. I am a hundred percent focused, and so my tendency is like do all the other stuff I want to do, and then when it's time to write that book, that's all I'm going to do is I'm going to write the book and become you know a recluse. Uh, but I've learned enough now. Knock on wood. I hope the book doesn't suck. But I've learned enough now to know like okay, I don't know how. This is what I do to focus the plot. This is what I do to figure out the, the beats. This is what I do to focus the outline. This is the mission statement. This is how I know where to go. This is how I break it down. I have so much of that now that it's less, I say it's less stressful right now, but we'll see. Well, I mean, it, you have to go into the chrysalis and, and you know, form everything again, right? But but the 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 difference is the lessons that you learn are like, you you you've kind of brought the the commandments down from Mount Sinai, <laughs> like you know the like thou shalts, and you have faith in the process. Uh, uh, that if you follow these tenets, by the end you're going to have something that you are proud of, and and that's that to me. It's like you want to really distill what experience is, what good experience is. That's what it is. That's and that's like God. That stuff that I think between andrew and i in 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 our or, you know making stuff like that's the stuff that i know the most and and you know I, I think for both of us the biggest lesson because we've got i will say charitably scattered minds at times like you know with that that have a, a lot of really cool ideas and we want to make really cool ideas and we both love facts and 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 cool discoveries and and i think that that's a, a, a both of our tendencies are like when we're at our most scattershot it's because we keep wanting to staple cool things onto an idea and so the clarifying tenant is like what is this about what is this about and that's something that i know i've talked andrew and i've talked about with writing it is a massive thing for me with podcasting i think it is a, a, an essential storytelling concept for any kind of narrative anything but it's like as soon as you dial into this is about this then that means now what was a distracting element of oh i want to staple all these things now you know like oh okay well i have to remove that but not all of it because there's a really cool element that that was that was really my instinct of what i wanted to include that and and actually i can make it better if it serves this other part and it's like those knowing those things and knowing that those things have resulted in good product like god that's experience that that is uh, uh the biggest it's huge there's no pressure to uh, like pre-selling a book that you haven't finished yet. And if and... someone did that, it would it would be a wholly different oh thing. My God. Even yeah, yeah, that'd be crazy, <laughs> crazy if somebody it's, did it, that. Hypothetically, the... having it already be on the bestsellers list. Okay, all right. Well, then let's <laughs> let's we should, we all right. We're gonna you end hear this that now. Frida McFadden. <laughs> I know. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm uh, getting, I'm getting, I'm getting text messages from, from both Thomas and Mercer that uh, we're, we need to end this. So Andrew no, can get to writing. This other thing. It's a totally the cookbook. different the cookbook. thing. The cookbook. Yeah. It's, yeah. A, yeah. it's a totally different thing. It's yeah. It's this, uh, you know, um, how to eat healthy by eating whale book. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> But there is that there is a difference. And again, this is not a woe is me. Woo. Um, mm -hmm. When you write for fun and you have your own schedule, it's one thing. It's another thing when you're part of a machine and, yeah. you know, 
And and the thing too is like, I'm glad I'm writing a book at this point because the reviews from the last one kind of help out. You can sort of see what people focused on and what people really like. Uh, but then there's also the pressure when the last thing people really, really liked it and you're still like, what am I doing? It's why sequels often suck because you don't know, like, you know, you what watch Karate Kid it. and you watch Karate Kid 2. You're like, man, they really didn't know what Karate Kid 1 was about. And you watch Karate Kid 3, like, man, they thought they knew what it's about. They really don't know what it's about. They really don't, yeah. And yeah. I would say if you are someone who is doing something for yourself right now, if you're still in that early phase where you're trying to trying to get started, a way to uh, kind of inoculate yourself to that in some sense would be to, you know, give yourself deadlines and give yourself hard deadlines and cutoff points. Hey, I need to get this done by Thursday. And if I don't, then I need to start again or I need to start a new thing. I need to get into, you know, getting stuff done in a certain amount of time because, I mean, even, you know, Andrew, right? Like you've got a lot of leeway in the point where you're at in this book, hypothetically. Um, but at the end of the day, you're other, you still have to, you still have these posts that you have to hit. That's your responsibility. That's, that's, that's one thing that as part of being, you know, a partner with these other people that you're working on, you have to be able to deliver, um, you know, on a Can certain I, time or, a, you know, of a certain length or quality. Let me, let me amplify and tweak that. Okay. Deadlines. I would tell people, I would advise people, unless you like literally have like, I got to pay my bill by the end of this month. Those are real deadlines. I would say the thing to commit to is time spent, is mm. to say, tomorrow I will spend two hours doing blank. Because I see this, I see this with myself, I see this with my girlfriend, where it's like, oh, I set this deadline to do this. I'm like, well, how do you know how much time it's going to take? How much? How do you know what time it's going to happen? How do you know what life's going to happen? Or there's all these other things that come in, like life interferes. And so I think deadlines are bad because we're always going to, we're always, we can't predict where things are going to be. But we can say tomorrow, like when I'm under a real crunch, the thing I do, I try to write leisurely how I feel, but when I'm on a real, real time crunch, I tell myself first four hours of the day belong to the book. No RSS yeah. feeds, no, mm -hmm. no phone calls, no Twitter, no nothing. I will get up, I will get something to eat. I won't even check my email. Um, I might have to check it for important stuff, but like the, other than that, I will check it once, take care of whatever I need to do. Then I will sit down for four hours and I will write. And I will get it done. And then I'll take a break and, you know, make notes or something. But I will spend four hours doing that. And things will get done. Things will get done magically. When I'm on a real strict deadline, but I advise just say I will spend X amount of hours tomorrow doing this or X amount of hours doing that. Because let's say, you know, you're writing a book and all of a sudden you realize you're writing something, like a time travel story. And you find out about this amazing story about, you know, some medieval battle. Well, shoot, maybe I need to go read the book on that. Well, I'm going to read the book, and now I'm going to be three days behind, and then you're going to miss your deadline. But if you say, oh, I'm spending three hours or four hours a day working on my book, and you say, okay, well, I'll either read it within that time frame or this, it's better. Systems are better than deadlines, and, and just allotting time, I will do blank. I, I, I still think there's, at some point, a sense, at least soft deadlines. That, like, like I think you're right, Andrew, in that you should build up a sense of how long it takes you to do things. I think that is something that uh, is a question that really throws people for a loop when it's like, okay, hey, I want to, I want you to do this. When can you have it by? And if you don't know, no, there's. Like when, I said there, I started but, saying they're real deadlines. I said they're real deadlines, like bill dates and stuff. But I'm saying like when it's uh -huh. slightly open ended. Well, you, let me let me let me finish. Let me finish. Let me, like I, I I agree. Like I think that you. Do you need you that that is what I, I guess what I'm saying about giving yourself your own internal deadlines, even if they're soft, is to get a sense of how long it's going to take you to get something done, whether it's in you know total hours spent, whether that's in how many days it realistically takes you among other things that you're doing. I think I think we're 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 we're, we're not too, too far off here. Yeah, I I would just say that most people have no idea. Most right. people who I know who struggle with deadlines have no effing idea how long a thing will take. And I see people get frustrated and depressed because, well, I set a deadline. Well, deadline's not a spell. It's not a magic spell that gets things done. Time spent is what gets it done. And when you set a deadline, if you have a really good idea how much time it'll take, yeah, deadlines are great. And I can, you know, I know uh, I have, I work with deadlines all the time. Uh, I, I, know. I think it's different for different people. I think some people will yeah. find the, find a different way because I, you know, uh, we have lots of deadlines here with with when shows should start and when's video when videos should come out and 
And I know for me, it, it's 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 very helpful to know when the deadline is because yeah, but you're, otherwise, you're talking about you're, you're talking about a train. You're talking about a schedule where you know what you're doing there. I'm talking about like if you if you said yeah. how long how long did Brian spend planning Modern Rogue? He spent a long time. He mm -hmm. didn't say, oh, in two weeks I'm going to have this thing done. Sure. He had to figure out how much time it takes to get things done. I'm talking for people at the start. Somebody's never written a book before. Somebody's never done a podcast before. They, uh, it, it's to say, have a deadline to me is like focus more on time spent. I, yeah, I think, yeah, the, the, the biggest key here is understanding whether or not a deadline or deadlines in general are, to me, they are disciplines. They are not necessarily motivators. Like it is, it is good to know, uh, uh, okay, well, I want something. I want some minimum viable product by this time. But then again, it's like if, if you are setting unrealistic, versions of this because you imagine that there's going to be some otherworldly motivation that will course mm -hmm. through you and that's what's stopping you from getting to the end uh i think oftentimes that can be something that uh, uh doesn't a produce the best work or really to go back to the idea of getting yourself into debt uh can be discouraging and if if the point of this is protect your in your, you are an engine right protect your engine of of being able to produce stuff then you know uh undo debt uh repeated self devaluation these are corrosive elements that i think bring you further away from your engine humming at at optimum precision I have I have a deadline for my book. I cannot get around that. That book is due on that deadline, and that is that's a real deadline. But my my way to get that done is I say how many I know now how many hours spent, mm -hmm. and I know how many hours spent, and so that's how I define. Like I know X amount of hours per day equal book done at this point, and that's from experience over time. When I first started writing, I would try to I would say how much writing can I get done in a week. I would try I would use deadlines to see more of the measure to see sure. how much I can get done. Yeah, and I, I just say my, I guess my I, advice I'm is not, and, and I, I'm just saying I, I'm just putting out there that you you need to get to a point where you can get that. Maybe, yes. maybe it's not at the beginning, but that I'm I I don't think we're saying really any really very different here. I just want to, you know, it, you're right. Like yes, you're you're right here. <laughs> you know, uh, but you want to get to a point where you can work within deadlines. You can't get to a point where you're going to spend a million hours on something just to get Agreed. it to the right thing here so uh, I, if i couldn't work in the dead i wouldn't have a career uh, my publishers would have fired me and there would be you know i'd be living in your place bryce um <laughs> it, it it's it's that's probably you, made I, for a warmer really, living room <laughs> and that's what i was saying before or earlier was that like when i started off writing i didn't have to deal with those and now i have to deal with those deadlines but the way i deal with them though is still i'm gonna spend four hours a day on this and i'll spend four hours a day on this and then if i'm getting closer and i'm screwed i will increase the amount of time i spend and, and get it done but from a i say just from a particularly people starting out from a stress point of view mm. focus on time spent focus on time spent because you will feel better you will not feel crappy about yourself you won't feel horrible that you missed this thing because like we, when people set unrealistic deadlines and they feel all you know is failure because of unrealistic it demoralizes you but when you said yeah i spent three hours today like legit, it was three hours writing. I got three hours writing done today, three todays. Holy crap, things happen fast. Yeah. So we agree, everybody. Indeed. <laughs> Bryce, I can only imagine the number of deadlines, Bryce. Like, Bryce, you, your life is a nightmare for me. <laughs> well, it's, you know, um, and it's, again, it's, it's a similar thing, right? I've got processes for all of these different shows, and so... Um, you know, I have a sense of when I need to be there's in the a, right place and stuff. And, and that, that's, there's a, a reason why you're in this job too. <laughs> the way you are right. No, the way you are wired, you understand that? Like the way Bryce's brain works, you can handle this. You're able to do, you've got a spreadsheet in your head or sense of, you know, ability to comprehend that too. Yeah. Which I envy. It's, it's, um, it, it's, it, it, it's building the process and building up the habits and, and, um, and it, it will be different for different people. You know, some people are motivated by the deadline that that's, you know, uh, you know, some of the video stuff, you know, we do the live streams and live streams kind of should start right about the right time. The videos, they got a, they got a day that they should go out, but really you got to get it done. And if there wasn't the deadline, then it would be later. It would be slower and it would probably be the same product. So, um, 
you know, I, I know we, uh, like Brant, one of our other producers here, like he, he said before, you know, like if he had unlimited time to work on videos, he would spend it. If it's polishing, researching, adding stuff into it. Um, but there is a balance there between perfection and delivery. And um, for, for me, and I'm sure for, for a lot of people, the deadlines are an organizational structure. But that, again, that's a lot. And there are people out there who will give themselves the deadlines and put themselves under a lot of pressure um, that is unnecessary for a soft or you know a deadline for yourself. So don't, definitely don't do that. Don't burn yourself out before you begin. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's the the real learning starts after the calluses are formed. All right, picks. Ooh, picks. Um, <laughs> uh, you know what? Uh, this uh, this uh, I'm saying this pick. This is a this is this is fine theater. This is theater that you, if you watch enough of it, you are going to get some things out of it. Um, but a lot of the times this is entertainment or a talk show. Um, but one of the things that I was doing a lot during the freeze was, you know, I was watching TV and I wanted something that wasn't about, you know, disasters at the end of the world or people dying and stuff like that. So uh, one really quick fix for drama uh, was the ABC uh, unscripted reality show Shark Tank. Um Shark Tank is neat. Uh, people go on and they uh, uh, pitch uh, these kind of now celebrity investors. Hey, I've got an idea and here's how much money I would like and how much equity I would give back and here's what I've got. And when you binge watch that show, you you get kind of in rapid pace uh, all of the mistakes that people make and all of the things that if you're a creator presenting something to someone you're trying to sell something to what, what those people need to know and where you kind of need to be at. You also see a lot of the, a lot of the strings and a lot of like, Oh, well this, this, this band is on here just so that there's a musical segment so that you can hear a little bit of music and have some entertainment. You know, uh, this guy with his, uh, hurricane power plant is just kind of the wacko for the week. You know, you see some of those little bits and bobs, but, but I, I think, you, you get some interesting business around and it's this is Mark Burnett. So it's very like big reality show, you know, American reality show format. But, you know, I think ultimately it's, it's, it's interesting. And I think if you're listening to this show and you don't already know about it, there might be something uh, interesting to see here. You know, shows like that. And I remember when I was watching uh, that was the bridge Dragon's dragon's den. It's interesting because you're watching expertise is hard being a financial expert's hard because you look at how many times like great businesses got turned down whatever and sometimes i'd be sort of skeptical like i don't know if they know but then there is a value sometimes sometimes it can be helpful to say to point out when things are out really bad like really bad but again like you said the show sort of stacked the deck with weirdos and stuff too yeah. but that can be helpful to sort of point out when you see them consistently say no this is a problem here it's hard for an investor to be able to talk pick great nobody can spot great because great's kind of a thing that happens but i do think that like i remember i don't know justin if you remember there's a thing that drove me nuts once there was a restaurant when i worked for the james randy foundation over on federal highway there was a lot that had been i forget a bunch of different little small like uh fast food places then one day a sign popped up because somebody was going to open up their own fast food place and it was not a chain. It looked like somebody's, you know, somebody wanted to open up this business and like they want to do like hot dogs and whatever. And we were cool, like, cool, there's a new restaurant coming here, except for the name. And that was there for a couple months, for like almost a year that this was coming soon. This was coming soon. And I'm like, how in the process of naming did somebody point out to this person, this is a really bad name? Their names, you go like, oh, I don't know if I get it, whatever. But then there are names where you're like, no, this is really a bad, this is a bad name. And you know, what's neat is like shows like this can point out like, hey, listen, this is, and sometimes, oh, that's what'll be the charm is the name so bad. Like maybe, or it'll work the opposite way. Yeah. You know, YouTube Red, what's wrong with YouTube Red? <laughs> well, it's got mm, some, it's got two, some mind share. Yeah, two of those words, maybe you don't <laughs> want to be associated with. And, you know, somewhere, you know, there was an argument at YouTube about YouTube Red, about people like, no, we can't call it this. Literally, like, and somebody's like, I've never heard of this. I, nobody knows about this. You're a perverted, Joe, you know? And then a while later, like, oh, you know, we think we need to change a name, you know? And it's like, 
stuff like that happens. So this restaurant duties. Oh, mm. can't be duties. Not when you're serving hot dogs. Yeah. No food, anything. I'm like, duties. are you kidding me? I'm like, is how is this it spelled? D D O O D I E. D O O D I E S. Oh duties, no, you, don't, you can't do I'm the like, real way either. Like, I think there may have been a duty there, and that was his nickname from childhood, and he how loved his duty? nickname. And this was a dream was to open this restaurant. That na- I'm like, I'm not. If you like, my theory is this: if you don't know why that name is bad. I don't know what other bad judgment you have. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it did not last. It was over really? like a weeks or month or something, and it shut down because it's like nobody wanted to eat at duties. <laughs> you guys want to go get some Starbucks. Duties? Yeah, it's a Starbucks. It does crazy good business. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and, and you know, kind of on the opposite side, uh, talking about how Shark Tank is theater, you know, the the people, the, the sharks on the show have come out and said, you know, like 20%, or more of the deals that we handshake agree on that show literally never happen. They never come through because the person pitching it in due diligence, we found out this was not right or whatever. And, uh, you know, a lot of people just go on that show because a lot of people watch that show. And and if you've got a consumer good, then congrats. You just got however many millions of people watching. So like there, there is a huge grain of salt to take with it. But I think, I, I think if you walk away and go, oh, yeah, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, this idea that I have is kind of segmenting the market down too, too far. Right. Uh, I, I think you can pull some some good ideas out of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, hey, Bryce, a uh, uh, really nice pick. My pick is Black Coral oh. by Andrew nice. Maine. Ah! <laughs> yeah, idiot. I'm so uh, dumb. I know. Yeah, a relentless nail biter, whether below or below the water line. Even the setbacks are suspenseful, says Kirkus Reviews. Uh, and and uh, I couldn't recommend it more. The second in uh, the the Sloan uh, trilogy there. So go get it right now. Andrew Maines, Black Coral. Get it. Thank you for that heartfelt endorsement, Justin. <laughs> uh I my pick is this uh, YouTube channel like comic books in some ways are kind of like video games for me for some reason I almost enjoy more hearing people talk about them than actually like reading or playing them sometimes sometimes they're great comics or whatever but sometimes somebody can get so much more meaning out of something and go oh that's really cool there's a channel which I've been watching some videos on I thought was pretty cool it's comic Drake. So he's on YouTube and he does these sort of deep dives into different comic book characters and explaining stuff. Because uh, like many people, after the last episode of WandaVision, I was doing a deep dive into some obscure Marvel yeah. characters. That's pretty cool. So yeah. the, it talks about, uh, uh, is this all comic related stuff? Or is this, I guess some of this is, looks like news and uh, comic dives. Books. Yeah. yeah. Check it out. Yeah, so he'll he'll do he's doing some stuff about WandaVision, you know, the uncanny Marvel creepiness of a vision, you know, about that comic. Uh he into did a whole thing on the on the Marvel pinup comic book issues where during the 90s Marvel did a run of comics that were pinups of Marvel characters. Ooh. Yeah. Weird, weird uh, time. And I was I was writing that demo. I don't know if I bought it, but I was definitely right. I, I was definitely marketed to for that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, She Hulk is pretty hot, let's just say it, you know. Uh, they had the dudes in there too, so it wasn't one sided, you know. Listen, nope. oh, good, no, nope. yeah, it was, uh, you know, uh, equally offensive to everybody, depending upon your exactly sensibilities. himbo, himbo cyclops, <laughs> yeah, yeah. There was, there's captions in there too, like literally, they have like, uh, uh, what's his face, um, uh, uh the steel dude from the X Men, um, Colossus. Magneto. Colossus, Colossus, sorry, Colossus, thank you, God, don't my brain. Like he's there, and they like ah, you know what? Uh, what he, what he saves on suntan. He's like laying out there, like what he saves on suntan lotion. He has to spend on steel polish or something. Oh and God. then they had like a, a <laughs> Punisher with a big skull cod piece. <laughs> Jeez, weird. Because you know, weird times. When the Punisher times goes to the, the beach, he he puts you know a big ass skull cod piece on. Like, <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Uh Comic Drake, very cool. Awesome. I'll check that out. Gentlemen, it's been after. Awesome. Hey, good awesome. stuff, everybody.
All right, boys, I am hungry. Yeah, I'm ditto. We are going to go offline. Thank you, everybody, for hanging out. We'll be back in a couple hours for Cord Killers. Uh, stay tuned to Night Attack. Check out Justin R. Young, at Andrew Main on Twitter. All the good stuff. Yay.